that Steve Jobs had. I don't, I don't believe that for a second. Uh, well, you know, maybe on. she could manifest it, but you know, I did, I think, you know, because he tried it. This is the thing, though. This, and we didn't have time to talk about it. But Steve Jobs postponed his chemotherapy right. on a natural means, and what happened is it got worse. Well, I would never, but but maybe and then, and then doing uh, the right thing. I would saying that never do chemotherapy if he didn't do that. I would never do the chemotherapy. That's poison. That's straight poison. That's straight mustard gas no. poison. That's <laughs> that's that's something I would well, you never. Know, the thing is I would say, never I suggest to anybody. I had this conversation with a family member. She's um, she's my aunt, and she's uh, she's four st- four stage in, in colon colon cancer metastasized into the liver. So she, she's 80 years old now, very healthy individual. Back in the 70s, she was the early adopter of these like organic, you know, farm kind of stuff, didn't eat anything in a can. And she stayed very healthy. Where she went wrong was she did a colonoscopy in her 50s and then never went back for follow up. So she was fine that first round, but said, oh, I don't need I don't need to do it again. But you need to do it every five years. Because the whole idea is to catch it early before it gets into your lymphatic system or your circulatory system. Well, it, it was slowly growing, slowly growing, eventually metastasized. It's in her liver. She started having eating problems and they do a CT scan and realize that she has colon cancer and took a big chunk of her colon out. And now they're treating the, the liver cancer side of this. And she opted to take the chemotherapy. Now she's in her 80s. Now in her case, I I was recommending not to take the chemotherapy because it probably would do more destruction than than anything. Right. Um, but if you're younger, and let's say this happened to, to me, and uh, you know, because I'm turning 50 this year, I'm I have scheduled in September a my my first colonoscopy. All right. It's because I've never had a colonoscopy, maybe I have colon cancer, right? I don't know. Now, if, if the, if the, let's say they said, you know what, we found some polyps, but you know, it's deeper than we would like. We're going to have to do a biopsy and they, you have stage four, Paul, God forbid, but you know, it's stage four, Paul. So what are you going to do? Because of my age and my fitness, and my indoctrination, <laughs> um, you know, I probably would lean towards getting the chemotherapy. If I was my aunt, um, you know, and I'm in my 80s, I would say, you know what, uh, I've lived a pretty damn good life. Um, so I think, you know, that that's my counseling son. Well, um, but I do agree with you that most chemotherapy is it's poisonous. Right. All chemotherapy is poisonous. And these late stages stage four, it's only giving you 12 to 24 months extra at, most at people best. Don't even, most people don't even live that. So, and one thing that should be illegal is doctors saying a death sentence. You got four months to live. You got one year to live. Almost everybody dies around the time that they say, and a lot of them go through the chemo to get there. But it's like you manifest your death. If you told them, if they, you thought they only had four months to live, I'd say, well, you still got another 10 years to live. Guarantee yeah. they're going to outlive that four months. Well, that's what but when you tell people. somebody four months to live, they're going to die in four months because they believe they're going to die. And that makes them die. It's as crazy as our manifesting abilities are. Yeah. This is what happens. I've seen it over and over and over. Mm. They gave my dad one year to live. He was dead in 10 months. Well, hold on. I got a better one for you. Why is it that people with dementia uh, live late years of their lives, like in the <laughs> 80s? Come on now. Help me out. I mean, if your brain's supposed to be shutting down, your body's supposed to be shutting down, you're becoming a vegetate, you're supposed to die because your brain is not core, uh, it's not sending messages to your heart, your lungs, and uh, your, your, your whole, whole entire body. Your brain is not sending messages because you don't get up and pee on time. You know, <laughs> the bottom line is modern medical science has an ability to sentence you. I sentence you to death in seven years. But the bottom line is 
Why is it that people with dementia living an additional 10 to 20 years? I have a buddy who I had on the missing link. His name is Scott McLean, if you want to check out the show. But they gave him four months to live. And uh, he had cancers throughout his body and everything. What he did was he fasted for 30 days. He didn't eat. Uh, I think he all he did was drink water for 30 days. Then he went on an organic um, fruit and vegetable diet, raw, nothing cooked, no oils. He oils. Uh, we had uh, one doctor. What was that doctor's name? Anyways, um, he's now that was 10 years ago. That's a guy that I went. They gave him four months to live. He's been able to reverse all those cancers, all these things, all this stuff that was going on inside of his body just by fasting and changing to organic fruits and vegetables. And he's now 10 years when they told him four months to live. Are you serious? 100%. You can, this is where it comes to the terrain theory and why what Dr. Amanda is saying is so valid because you change what you put into your body. You stop poisoning your body. You stop poisoning your body with, you know, even bread. Bread is genetically modified. The body doesn't recognize it as food. It automatically puts it into storage to protect itself. It doesn't process. That's why people are getting more and more obese because, you know, stuff like bread, this stuff is toxic, not to mention all the pesticides that are on it. But also oil, when you start cooking with oil, oil substances, it makes some kind of compound that now it's kind of harmful for your body. So Mm. it's, you know, it's really important, especially the vegetable oils and all these crazy oils. Those are all complete poison. You know, the Mm. stuff that they're making. If, you know, you're going to use oils, you want to obviously use more um, organic olive oil. Um, coconut oil there's also debates now whether coconut oil is good or not good you know you see yeah but the thing is is, you know the thing is is that life expectancy okay okay I can I can see that some people have been able to reverse certain diseases even cancers by some sort of organic means you know some natural means okay but here's the problem all right it's not going to happen for everybody if you're a doc well I don't I but it could. It but, but the reason why it can't happen for anybody because of discipline. Not everybody can go 30 days without eating food. Not everybody can train themselves to just eat organic. Not everybody. People like their cakes. People like their coffees. People like their yeah, sugar. But, but the life expectancy, <laughs> the life expectancy, on average, is increasing. All right. And if you go back to let's say the 1860s, or even the 1700s or the 1600s life expectancy was around 40. So, or even sanitation, sanitation was one of the big things before things were a lot more disease prone because of sanitation, the environment, you know, we've got a lot of things that have done and like some of these drugs and some of these vaccines, like the polio vaccine, it was actually on the decline before they actually created the vaccine for it. Right. I think a lot Mm -hmm. of this stuff is, you know, I think a lot of the stuff that we call science, a lot of stuff that we call from the big pharma, they're taking credit for things that they shouldn't be taking credit for. And then they're pr- promoting their poisons. They're promoting their vaccines. They're promoting these things. I think this stuff is all poison. I think you can put the proper stuff into your body like I done four and a half years ago. I stopped eating meat. I haven't had a cold or flu since. I've been healthy. I still eat a little bit of sugar and, you know, sweets. And I've got a little bit of a sweet tooth. I don't drink a Slurpee every day like I used to, but I haven't, I haven't had a cold or a flu in four years, four and a half years. I was sick once or twice every year. All I did was stop eating meat, start eating a lot more fruits and vegetables. I've always been a happy, positive person. I've always had a good mental attitude, but because my body had these toxins inside of them, it made me get sick. I don't get sick because someone sneezes on me and I need to get sick. I get sick because my body needs to release the toxins out of its body from all the poison and all the foods, the pesticides, the preservatives, you know, breathing in whatever they're spraying in the air. My body needs to get sick. I know I'm going to get sick again. At least I hope not, but it's probably going to happen because I'm still breathing toxic air. I'm still getting radiated by their radiation. Eventually, my body's going to have enough toxins that it's going to need to expel it to get sick. That's why we get sick. And this all right, is all right. So let, let me get an example. All right, caveman. All right, we look at the bones 
And we can understand that they did, died from certain types of diseases and even had arthritis, right? Which is inflammatory. They were eating as organic or as natural as you can get, you know? And they had low densities in their tribes. Okay. But but maybe they so, were just on a meat diet. Maybe they weren't eating fruits and vegetables. Maybe they weren't getting the vitamins that they needed in order to be able to not have these things growth. We don't know what they were eating at the time, but maybe they didn't. They just ate meat. Maybe they just killed animal and ate meat and didn't get nutrients. Maybe they ate it wrong. Okay, let, let me give let, let me give you an example. Like, yeah, maybe, maybe you know, <laughs> you know. But <laughs> let's say you're you're a doctor, okay. Jesse, and a patient comes in, right? You're an MD, right? You know, and obviously you've been going through the indoctrination. But you have this knowledge and you're not sure if natural will work. And you're not quite sure that allopathic will work. All right. And you're at a crossroad. And it you not only have a service to the patient to try to, you know, because of the Hippocratic Oath to, to help them but you also have to worry about a lawsuit. And you're probably more protected from the lawsuit by using allopathic means than let's say natural means because the family members may go, well, you know, our mother came in, she had cancer and you said just, you know, eat an all organic diet and she died and you didn't give her chemo. So now I get sued because I was trying to help them using a terrain theory. Well, I'm more protected by, you know, by the medical mafia, as you say it, uh, you know, and, and, you know, and, and, you know, my malpractice insurance, if I use allopathic means, because it's what they call, you know, science-based, <laughs> that's, that, that's their science. -based. So, but, but the thing is, you see the problem that physicians that want to try to transition into that realm, to try to help heal, they're opening themselves up to a lawsuit if it doesn't work. But you can tell them. So no matter what, if you tell someone to eat healthier, proper vitamins, no matter what, they're going to be healthier. They're going to get better. Maybe they not cure whatever it is that they've got, but a hundred percent, they're going to be healthier. That this you can't. There's no way to. There's no way to argue that that's not going to happen. If someone's eating healthier, they're having a better diet, they're going to be healthier. In right, to but they could still die from the cancer. But, but they could still die from the cancer. But so what I'm saying is every single medical doctor should, you know, be telling people, look, you need to start eating better. Cut out the sweets, cut out the coffee, cut out this. This is number one thing that every single doctor, if you really cared about your patient, you I'm should be one. telling them to eat healthier. That's the number right. one that terrain theory put, but you need to put better stuff into you. Now the right. options are we could do this, which potentially could cause this. We could maybe could do some chemotherapy, but it's going to burn your cells. You've got these options, what you can take. The number one thing I'm telling you is to start eating healthier. These are other options that are presented to you. You can choose. This will get you away from getting any lawsuit because you're presenting them the options. You've been giving them, you're 100% honest with them, and you're telling them to eat better, which is going to ultimately make them healthier. Yeah. yeah. Okay, my statement I mean, is this. Yeah, Hold on, Doc, one second. The problem I'm having with both sides is one side says eat healthier, be better. Okay. The other side says take this medicine, you'll be better. Okay. You know, for every chemical, biochemical that we receive or pill we receive or shot that we receive, there's always that list of side effects. This could cause heart disease. This could cause this. This could cause that. You could die. I mean, it could die. It's, it's all these side effects. Now, on the other side, over here, we have the statement, well, it's just normal eating. But, you know, there, there are fruits and vegetables out there that are also, quote-unquote, poisonous to the human body, i.e. the collard green, i.e. Um, they're fruits that are really toxic to the body. I hate to say it, but kiwi. I mean, they're not a fan of kiwi. I really? love my kiwi. I mean, I'm a I kiwi, kiwi demon, bro. I, really? I'm I mean, a kiwi, kiwi demon. But it can kill you. I mean, anything can kill you. The bottom line is, who's willing to take the risk? Because guess well, what? You take it every day. 
But right, the big that's thing the is, is the belief. And this is where we've got something, you know, uh, what's that, the, um, the method where you give someone uh, some, some medicine or some pills, and then you give someone placebo, and then the person's going to get better thinking that they're getting that drug and they're going to get better anyway. So belief in whatever you're doing is number one. If you believe that the chemo is going to help you and you truly believe that the chemo is going to help you, even though it's poison, even though it's poisoning your cells, probably fucking up other kind of stuff inside of your body. <laughs> if you truly believe it's going to help you and heal you, you're going to heal. That's right. the number one thing I think that people need to understand when it comes to whatever you're doing. If you think you're going to eat something and it's going to make you sick, well, guaranteed, if you keep eating that and keep eating it and think, oh, well, I don't care, I'm going to get sick, you're going to get sick. That's part of our manifestation abilities here that we have here. You sound like Lori. Good God. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, Paul, she he sounds just like her. I can manifest it. And I'm sitting here also thinking, well, you know something? People do manifest what they want, but then there's the sign. It, I mean, if both of your, your types of medicines can combine, get rid of the pharmaceutical industry. Get rid of them and just combine. Use the homeopathic medicine that's naturally based. Then all of this will work. I mean, your science. Yeah, I think it depends on the. I think it depends on the disease in the state of the disease. But isn't all you the know, chemicals? Like, but isn't it all stuff that they're giving to yeah, you? Yeah, but you know, actually they, comes from like they. What like they, they, they do is they make it chemical. They make it chemical, and so that way they can patent it. Like. You know, if they were taking some of this stuff like uh, uh, All about the money. what's the aspirin, white willow bark, white yeah. willow bark is the natural stuff in the aspirin. You take white willow bark, it's something natural. You take the aspirin, now it's a it's a chemically compounded formula. So that's like the white willow bark, but so this way they can patent it. If you start giving people these natural stuff that they make this allopathic medicine on, maybe it's not going to have this you know, harmful effects on the bodies where you got to take a blood test every single because month because it's you could get a whole right. hundred other issues. Right. If we started putting more natural right. but that, That's a little bit different. That's a little bit different than what Bolmer's saying, Dr. Bolmer's saying, you know, so because what you're, you're saying is it's more like instead of very high concentrated, very targeted pharmaceutical compounds, find a natural analog that's probably better on the body. Like hundred percent, hundred percent. So you know, there, there, there is God provides a plant, or God provides something here for every single ailment that we have. We just need to figure out naturally how to put it. The problem is the money and the patent. They don't want to have natural stuff. They outlaw can they outlaw cannabis? They outlaw cocaine. They outlaw you know uh, the the what's the morphine the. Uh, the poppy seeds you know they outlaw this stuff but yet they can take the poppy seeds make it into morphine patent it call it morphine but you're not allowed to have the poppy seeds when no. this stuff is natural and actual healing right. right this is where the big problem and disconnect the sorcery part of it let's just change it let's patent it let's make money off of it and outlaw the you know the natural stuff don't let them have the natural stuff. Make think people think that dandelions are weeds. Let's spray them with cancer-causing, you know, Roundup when you could actually just keep the dandelions, make dandelion tea out of it, and help reduce yourself from inflammation and cancers. Hmm. That's interesting. So, Jack, that's in the, in the room here, do you have a question? Jack? Uh, yeah, Paul. Um, if you don't mind... Uh, couple of things. One, I would be interested more in uh, what evidence we've got for Barrick's fifth cocktail and uh, why we're not hearing more about that. And then a second uh, second question uh, or comment I've got about the origins of, uh, of HIV. Okay, so let me, you know, start with the first question. In Barrick's CV, most people that talk about SARS-CoV-2 haven't Googled it's very easy. Google Ralph Barrick CV and it pops up. There's two versions. There's a long version or a short version. If you read the long version, it explains the research grants and their numbers and the, and the funding, the actual monetary funding. 
for different research projects that he has done. And during his co-development with she and Dr. Sims between 2009 to 2000, I think 13, there is a, a couple line items that are very telling on his CV. I think it's in, in the, on the long version, I think it's in, in part B of, the, of his CV. But when you look at it, it starts talking about a, a coronavirus vector. And that coronavirus vector is being used as a vaccine platform that they were experimenting for influenza and HIV, two separate research studies. So from that, we can infer that they have modified the genome of SARS-CoV-2 to be able to code for at least those proteins, to get those specific proteins um, onto the shell of the SARS-CoV-2 package, <coughs> meaning the H protein for influenza and a fully functional glycoprotein a 120 and glycoprotein 41 from HIV. So they can do the experimentation for the vaccine vector. I'm proposing that not only do they have a, a beta coronavirus vector vaccine program for influenza and HIV that's on his sheet, which was the overt research funding, but what was going on in Barrick's lab was dual purpose. And I'm not the only one to say this. Dr. Malone said this too, the guy that was, you know, one of the inventors of the messenger RNA platform. When the federal government does the funding and when DARPA comes in, it's dual purpose. You know, there's an overt operation and a covert operation. So we're inferring that the covert operation is the development of the modification of the SARS-CoV-2 genome where if you get a SARS-CoV-2 infection, it gets into your lungs, it gets into the type two alveolar cells, starts to spread. And as it's coding, as it's replicating, because they've inserted an 8,000 nucleotide sequence, AKA HIV, into a 30,000 genome that you could actually multiply HIV in the tissue in your lung. So your original infection is a SARS-CoV-2 infection that leads to an HIV infection um, in its first replication um, iteration. So it's based on what's on his, on his CV. And the realization that there are dual, there are two dual purposes. There, there, there are dual, there are dual purposes that are going on in these labs: an overt operation and a covert operation. Now, I am take that I am also taking the stance that the vaccine program that was coming out of Moderna and out of Barrick's lab and some other labs. You know, there was a. There was also a monoclonal antibody uh, company. I don't remember the name of it. That was, you know, that was tied to DARPA. Um, they were the quote the antidote to the weapons program. So when you're making the weapon, you have to be able to neutralize it for your population or for your your soldiers, so they don't get sick, right? So you're battle ready, right? In addition, if you know with some certainty what your adversaries are developing in their laboratories, you have to have some sort of antidote or some sort of vaccine against their biological weapons. So this leads to the covert um, development and, and, the, and partially the overt development of what was going on in Barrick's lab. So it's the main source is coming from his CV. Um, now, the origins, what would specifically were, was your question about the origins of HIV? 
Well, I might you have a specific with, question. Yeah, I might start with a comment and uh, relate yeah. something that I heard years ago about uh, HIV and uh, and get your take on that. And it relates to BIV or bovine immunodeficiency virus, and and then later some stuff I found about gag protein. Uh, back in the in the late 80s, I was on a flight from uh, Bangkok to Tokyo and sat next to an epidemiologist from Johns Hopkins who had been presenting a hypothesis at a big AIDS summit at the height of the uh, HIV pandemic in, in Bangkok. And he gave me a copy of this article that he published in the Johns Hopkins alumni magazine. And, he, and his concern was about the epidemiology of HIV in Africa. That was his expertise. And he said that the pathology of this followed very closely uh, hepatitis B vaccine program in programs in Africa. Uh, and he was involved with, with that program and these hepatitis B vaccine programs and he said the, it was the total reverse. He said typically the, uh, the epidemiology in, in Africa is that these pandemic illnesses start in cities and then they spread along the highways into remote areas. He said HIV popped up in multiple remote areas at the same time that correlated with the uh, with, with WHO and Pasteur Institute uh, vaccine programs. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it traveled, and then it progressed from there into the cities. Uh, his hypothesis was that this was that that this resulted from uh, a culturing of early HIV or early hepatitis B vaccine in cattle stomachs at the Pasteur Institute, which could have also been infected with BIV. Uh, he then also said that there's other there was other concerning issues that it also, the, the early HIV-1 surfaced in gay communities in San Francisco and uh, Miami that were also subjects, subject to these early uh, HIV or early uh, uh, hepatitis B vaccine programs. Uh, his contention was that it was an accidental release, but then, you know, later in, in media, I've encountered some people who had worked with an AIDS research that came to us and wanted to get on some of our radio programs. Uh, and we pretty well shut them off and they, they weren't wackos. They, they seem to be pretty, uh, pretty well versed and they, they had a pretty solid premise, uh, that that was part of a, of a weapons program. And then there's later some references to Kissinger and some of these other. Yeah. Programs. I mean, I don't know about a weapons program. I'm sure that they've been doing weapons programs that are, you know, with a lot of different pathogens, mm -hmm. not just viruses, but, you know, parasites and also bacteria. Mm -hmm. um, I just been focused with the SARS-CoV-2. There is an interesting thing that's going on with children getting hepatitis B now. There's an uptake, yeah. uh, you know, and, and so children with diabetes maybe the, as well. Diabetes. Yeah, so maybe there is something to you know to be said. I I don't know of some sort of weapons program with hepatitis B. Now, it is true that a lot of HIV patients end up getting uh, hepatitis. Um, and you know, part of that is because of drug use. Part of that is because of uh, you know, certain, you know, social norms that they're practicing at the time. So, but there does seem to be a correlation. I mean, we were taught in medical school that there's a correlation between hepatitis and HIV. Um, it doesn't mean that it's causative. Um, and you may have a patient, you may have a group of people that have hepatitis before they have HIV, and you may have people that have HIV before they get hepatitis. Um, you know, especially the ones that get HIV first and they're not treated early with ART there and they start getting a high viral load and they get a low CD count that's below 500, mm -hmm. they are more susceptible to opportunistic infections and, 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 um, you know, contracting, let's say hepatitis. Now, what is interesting that you're bringing up with what was going on in Africa Pasteur was is that 
there was a, and I, I talked about this in my video today, there was a laboratory called, I believe it was called, um, um, what was it called? It was called um, Stanleyville. I think it was called Stanleyville. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Out in the, in the Congo. And this is happening around 1956 to 1959 for oral vaccines. They were doing a, an experiment to see if their oral vaccine manufacturing was safe and effective, all right, for polio, polio vaccine. Mm -hmm. They were making it from kidney tissues from chimpanzees. They happen to have SIV. So there seems to be a correlation on the growth medium and the cell cultures, the, mono, the monocellular cultures that they were putting in these flasks to grow certain types of viruses to create feedstocks um, for their vaccine. So it is very plausible based on just what Mikovits has mentioned that the way they make certain types of vaccines, not all vaccines are made this way, but certain types of vaccines, especially ones that are using um, growth serums and, and, uh, and tissue from animals that potentially could have viruses in them that have not been filtered out. And there's gonna be a small percentage of the lots for the vaccines that will have these replicated SIVs or BIVs or XIVs or whatever. So the theory is, is that HIV potentially was created because of a vaccine program on accident because of the way they were making the vaccine. So I think what Mike, the biggest con contribution I think Mikevitz has to the whole SARS-CoV-2 thing isn't pandemic and all this stuff, but the very fact that she has seen in the laboratory through you know, her experience that vaccines aren't safe at times. Doesn't mean all vaccines are bad. Doesn't mean that, you know, that certain lots can't be okay, but the way it's manufactured is flawed. And that I think that what Dr. Vollmer was saying about artifacts and certain things and that vaccines cause harm, I agree, you know, and that some of these artifacts, which she calls artifacts, are literally viruses from the species that we are taking tissue from and growing viruses in uh, to be able to make these, these live and attenuated viruses. Um, but not all vaccines are attenuate, live attenuated viruses. So, and I recently, within the last year and a half or so, had, I needed a polio shot when I was doing my research on the, the, animal, the animals that we were injecting you know, to cause the GBS. So for me to be in the laboratory, this was a BSL, this was a BSL-2 laboratory. So in that laboratory, I had to have uh, an updated polio shot. Because the concern was is that the animals in the laboratory may, might have polio and I might contract. So as a precaution, I had to take the polio vaccine. Now I was born in 72, so the vaccine that I would have had when I was a kid would have been the attenuated live version, most likely was oral. I don't remember it, but that's probably what happened. Um, but not everywhere in the world when they got the feedstock used the chimpanzee kidney tissue to grow the vaccines. And it only happens if you use a certain type of chimpanzee that happens to be local to Congo. So this is part of the reason why it, they, they think that it starts in Congo through the, the polio vaccine program that came out of Stanleyville, it's a laboratory. So, you know, so there's, I think there's adequate evidence to suggest that, that HIV ju jumped into humans through SIV, through the polio vaccine program in the Congo. The problem is 
that there is tissue, lymph node tissue, that was in Scotland coming from um, uh, some research that was going on at the time in Africa, but the, this tissue was preserved in, in, in Scotland. I think it's Scotland. Um, and they were able to take a look at this lymph node tissue and it happened to have, when they looked, it happened to have HIV. That tissue was harvested in 1930s. So it seems as though HIV was in the population in Africa, in that region, in West Africa, um, as early as the 1930s from at least the samples that we have. The question is, how did it get there if it was there before the vaccine program? So I'm suggesting that you probably had multiple things going on. It probably had a zoonosis where you had some sort of jump between chimpanzee to humans because of eating the, the uh, chimpanzee meat. But because they were inoculating millions of people in, from 1956 to 1959, that there was also an additional introduction of that SIV slash HIV jump into humans because of the, the polio vaccine. And that you have some groups of HIV that's probably tied to zoonosis that happened before 1930. And you have some types of HIV or subgroups that happen to be coming from these accidental issues of, of vaccine production. I don't think that they did it on purpose. I think a lot of people in the, in, you know, in the kind of alternative community will kind of say, well, this must have been some sort of depopulation from the government and all this. I, I don't think so. I just think there was just medicine back in the 1950s was rudimentary in comparison today, but it was advanced compared to what they were doing in the 1600s. So it's all relative, but I think that the knowledge of purifying these cell cultures and knowing what kind of diseases were in them at that time was very rudimentary and it, it was just accidentally put into the population and not you know, it wasn't done on purpose. I think there was a cover up though, that when people were starting to realize that you had S40 in, 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 in these um, uh, vaccines, I think it was a smallpox vaccine, and you, you, know, you had this SIV that, you know, that, that seemed to be popping up in uh, vaccine production if you use certain types of primates, there was this cover up um, because. Big Pharma already invested so much money in the attenuated virus manufacturing, and they weren't going to shut that down. So I think there was a concerted effort to just kind of like whitewash it, and I think that's where the crime, you know, was wasn't so much they tried to do depopulation or cause harm; it was the cover up that you know to keep Big Pharma afloat. And I think this was the beginnings. Of, of, you know, think about it. The ones that are in the know have evidence to suggest that vaccine programs have made the HIV epidemic worse. All right. Well, what do you do when shortly after AIDS starts to really take hold in the 1980s? in the United States, what does Congress do? All of a sudden they make an act in 1986, all right? We don't have a really good treatment for AIDS yet. And all of a sudden they make an, a, an act in 1986 to absolve tort law on the manufacturing of vaccines. So yeah, I think when you connect the dots, I think there was a concerted effort to protect big pharma in the vaccine manufacturing program because they knew that there was flaws in the manufacturing techniques. You know, we have recombinatory type techniques now that they didn't have uh, in the 50s and very rudimentary in the 80s. 
So, you know, we're a little bit more precise, but we still had ma manufacturing problems with vaccines and still cause, even if we didn't have any manufacturing problem with the vaccine, we still have vaccine injury, you know, for other reasons. Um, so I think that, I think these, there's a constellation of, of, of a pattern here of cover up and, and to try to protect big pharma. But I think you're right, Jack, that these tissues that they're taking from these different, different animals, they can harbor their version of the disease. And when we are introducing it into our population, um, especially in mass, like we're talking about millions of people being inoculated, it's setting it, uh, the stage for gain of function. See, mm -hmm. this is kind of like the big experiment that what was going on in 1956 to 1959. That was the big experiment for gain of function, SIV to HIV, all right? What Barrick did in the laboratory was something very similar. You know, in the sense of serial passage, putting it into a lot of cell lines, a lot of animal models to get this thing to get mm. SARS-CoV-2 more lethal from the original chimera that came out of Dr. Xi's lab. So it wouldn't surprise me that some of the ideas that Barrick had to develop this serial passage technology came right from what they were observing from the, from Congo. That seems to fit very closely with what I recall uh, the Hopkins epidemiologist relating. He, his contention was that it wasn't on purpose, that it was an accident. And he said the, the early prototypical hepatitis B vaccines were cultured in cattle stomachs in at the Pasteur Institute because that was the, the quickest, most reasonable, cost-effective way to produced the prototypical virus vaccines. Once they got the proof of concept, then they went to a, right. uh, a genetically developed vaccine. But his, his big concern was the, the epidemiology of this. He said the correlation between the areas that had uh, to, to where HIV had surfaced in areas where there had been th these hepatitis B vaccine programs, the prototype programs had been implemented and as well within the U.S., and he said he had, as I recall, the evidence that he had in his article tracked these lots, and he said that what would have had to happen was that you would have had not wouldn't have been one lot. You'd had to have this happen multiple times, and that the precautions when they cultured this, that that, that the cattle that they used for the for culturing these, these doing these bacterial cultures were had to be checked for numerous. Uh, pathogens, infections, such as BIV, but he, his contention was that there is a window, like with HIV, to where uh, cattle can, can be positive, can be infected with BIV, but they don't, the testing at the time, they might not show positive for weeks after that infection is going on. It's an immuno immunological response, and he said that strain of BIV that was related, that they coded back uh, that they found in the uh, uh, in these cases in the in the infections in the wild as, the, mm -hmm. as a result of the vaccine program was pretty highly correlated to a very common strain or or genetic strain of BIV that exists in about 20 percent of cattle, but it's it's a fairly benign virus in cattle where it's it's active in the simian and the human form. Right, 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 right. You know, the thing is, is that back, you know, back in the 50s, we didn't have really good technology in terms of mm -hmm. testing for how to or what to test as an antigen. We didn't have PCR invented yet. And, you know, we, our understanding of the immune system was extremely rudimentary. And I still think our understanding of the immune system is still rudimentary, but it's far more advanced than back in the 50s. So, um, you know, so, but today, if we know what to look for, such as you're, you're making a batch, even if you're using animal culture and serum mm -hmm. to grow a, a, a virus, a live virus, 
we have means, better control mechanisms in place and better processes to filter out the bad stuff and to check to see if anything still went through the filter and it's in the final product. By testing um, an antigen, if we know what to test for, um, seeing if there are certain antibodies that might, um, might be present in the, in the serum, um, or uh, the better technique is PCR. Now, there's a lot of people that say, oh, PCR is garbage and never use it. But the thing is, is that you can use PCR and it's a great tool. Not only are you testing for, um, you know, you have this reverse primer and, and forward primer and the fan probe. The fan probe is kind of like the middle part that fluoresces to show that you're, you detected what you're looking for, all right? But PCR can also be used to amplify. And when you're amplifying a sample that you don't know, and you use next gen sequencing techniques, you can sequence to see what's in the sample and not know. You don't, you, you might think. So you, you know, what you're gonna see is in the sequencing of the sample is the virus that you're growing, but also through that sequence, you're gonna see something that's not supposed to be there. And, when, and then when you match it to the when you match it to the database, most likely because we have a large database now, most likely it'll get a hit saying, oh, you're, you're detecting something that's of CIV or SIV or some other, some other virus. And then you would realize, oh, our manufacturing upstream had some sort of contamination. And then you could close that lot, make sure it doesn't reach the light of day, and then uh, you know, start the process over. So this is a benefit of PCR as a control mechanism. Right. But you listen to the trained theorists and they go, PCR is all bad. Oh, it's all junk. Sequencing is all junk. And you can't use that as a control mechanism. You can use it as a control, as a control feature. You can use it as a, uh, a method to amplify something in low quantities to, 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 to you know, understand ratios and stuff. It, you know, when you're talking about um, um, RNA, up regulation because it's not necessarily true that you know you have you you have DNA that's coding for messenger RNA that codes for a protein, but you may have upregulated messenger RNA and no protein because there's other processes within within the cell that is saying don't turn it into a protein yet, and so you can measure these ratios and understand what's going on in the cell, but you can't you you. To do that, you need to be able to amplify low quantities of, of, of sample to be able to understand these ratios. So PCR is a great tool to, to do this on top of it being diagnostic. We're being told in medical school, in the near future, all, let me repeat, all pathogens are going to be PCR'd and that will be the gold standard. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so you have the terrain theorists out there, they're, they're gonna, they're going to say, oh, my God, you know, that means that it's all it's all garbage. It's all fake. But yet it's it's cheaper and more reliable. But they don't want to dive in to why it's cheaper and more reliable. Like, for example, have we seen the inside of an atom? No, we infer the inside of an atom because of all these particle accelerator data that 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 we have. But then they go, that's fancy, fancy mathematics that I don't understand. And therefore, it has to be false. Well, just because you don't understand it doesn't mean it's false. It just means that you haven't gone through the right training to understand quantum physics. You know? So, so I, I don't, you know, but in terms of in terms of, of vaccine reliability, manufacturing reliability, because I think a big part of vaccine injury is because of the way it's manufactured. Not the only reason, but I think it's a big, big part of the reason. And I think uh, Mike of its contrib big contribution proves my point here. We need to have uh, a third party come in and validate the contents of, vac of vaccines to make sure that they're safe and effective instead of the, the reliance of just big pharma and their clinical trial. And the sad thing is, is that this, 
oversight was supposed to be done in Congress. But Congress is not doing the oversight. So they just like, they just wash their hands from their responsibility. Where's the oversight of big pharma making sure that the vaccines that have been approved maintain safety and effectiveness? Um, that's a big hole in, our, in, in, in the industry. And I think that that needs to be regulated much heavier. Um, so, but I, I agree with you that, you know, when you're using animal parts to grow viruses or you're using them in terms of making pharmaceuticals of some sort, it's not necessarily true that that vaccine or pharmaceutical is pure. And when it's not pure, you're, you may be introducing pathogens to the human population that could be catastrophic, like HIV. I think HIV, in a sense, was man-made, but not man-made like what Barrick did in the laboratory with SARS. It was man-made in the sense that it was not, it was our, it was our lack of understanding during vaccine production that led to the catastrophe in the Congo. And it's also man-made in the sense that even through zoonosis, that if they weren't eating the chimpanzees, they wouldn't have had the, 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 the zoonotic jump. So man caused that too. But it wasn't that they were in a laboratory creating HIV. But I do think that once they had HIV in the laboratory, that that was further enhanced and developed. And the goal was to how to weaponize it. And, the, and this is where Barrett comes in. HIV is liquid transmission only. So it's a very poor weapon system. When you can program a large genome that's a respiratory virus, then you can be able to merge and use that beta coronavirus platform as a means to weaponize HIV. Because the HIV genome is small. And it's and the beauty of beta coronavirus is that it's programmable and it's respiratory. It's a respiratory infection. That means it's aerosolized. And so, you know, that's a perfect weapon system, Jack. So that's you know why I keep on pushing Barrick and his involvement with, with HIV, with beta coronaviruses, all the key players that were helping President Trump and in, in, you know during the crisis, they were all HIV. They were all HIV experts. That's not a coincidence. That's not a coincidence. You know, so I I think that there's enough. You know, if we put on our David Ike hat, you know, there's enough dots to connect to point us towards a weapons program that's dealing with HIV. But the early days of HIV, I don't think were man-made. I think that it was man's intervention accidentally caused the catastrophe. That kind of leans more toward my premise, but... Uh... I mean, were you able to listen to the, the debate tonight or no? No, I tuned in kind of late, Paul. I'll go back and watch that. I'll yeah, push well, the replay. You know, I'll push the replay back out again for you, Dr. Paul. All right. But, you know, the, there, the, you know so there was a two-hour discussion, you know, between germ theory and terrain theory. And I wouldn't even say that I'm a pure germ ther theorist, but, yeah. you know, but the thing is, is that, um, you know, I do think that homeostasis in the body helps with preventing disease, but to say that germs don't exist, I think it's a little crazy. Um, but what I'm finding is, is that a lot of these individuals that are trained theorists, and I don't know where you are on the whole spectrum, Jack, but it seems to me that they, 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 don't, have a, they don't have a real strong understanding of what's going on in the laboratory. And they want absolute knowledge and not inference. They, they want, you know, sometimes you can't, you can't get 
absolute proof. We have to infer it. You know, well, the perfect to... example is, 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 is atoms. You know, it, the atom theory is through inference of the particle, you know, acceleration and, and, and destruction. You know, so if they don't believe the mathematics then they don't believe the theory. So I think it's, it's similar in the sense of germ, germ theories is that they're working in the realm of all natural, naturopathic means and, and they don't want to, they don't want to believe it's becoming a religion now. It's not about science. It's becoming religion. And then they, they spin it as, well, the germ theorists are the, are the ones that are perpetuating lies. And I'm like going, how can that be? I mean, maybe I have groupthink. I don't know because of medical school. But I mean, I'll tell you right now, Jack, if I was on a, on a pedestal and I was saying some of the stuff that Dr. Volmer was saying, um, I wouldn't get my licensing for medical for, for an MD. There's no way, you know. So I just you know, say it's just I don't know. I, I I don't know how to. I don't know how to handle these types. I question Paul if. If some of these people, you know, if they're emotionally, they're egotistically, it's got the, this thing that they want to believe has gone to their emotions. And then once it goes to your feelings and your emotions, uh, that becomes thought. And anytime you try to contradict that with facts or science, you're, you're contradicting their ego, their emotions, their feelings. And once that's involved, it, 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 it's, it's, it's a form of what Malone talks about in his mass formation psychosis. It's very, it's damn near impossible to counterman that or to get anybody to rationalize that because you're going up against their ego and their emotion. The right, right. Exactly, Jack. You know, and the thing is, like with Malone, he was making a vaccine to, you know, obviously, to, you know, to try to stop, you know, SARS-CoV-2, right? Or, you know, was, you know, creating a platform that was programmable that could be used two ways, you know, to fight disease or could be used as a vaccine, right? You know, to, to get an immune, immunogenic response to, to prevent disease. So obviously Malone, MD, um, is, is, you know, sees that there are germs that, that, that cause disease or manifest disease, all right? When I was talking to Volmer, I could, I was shocked, literally shocked. When she goes, I asked her, SARS-CoV-2, does it exist or not? She goes, it doesn't exist. And not only that, the ACE2 receptor doesn't exist. And my jaw dropped because I'm like going, do you have any idea what the ACE receptor does? And she goes, it doesn't exist. And I'm like going, you need receptors in your body for communication. And she goes, these receptors don't exist. It's just a bunch of, of molecules that are just floating in your blood. But I'm like going, you need these molecules in your blood for communication, true, but how do you think they, they communicate to the cells? They need, they, need, they need docking stations, right? They need receptors, right? So it just doesn't float in your blood. It's, it was, it, it, her concept was very rudimentary. It was like almost like I was talking to someone from the 1600s. Mm. And, I, and I, I told her, you need the ACE receptor to control your blood pressure. And this is part of the reason why people were becoming um, hypotensive. You know, you had these cases where people were dropping. Well, what happened was with SARS, you, you know, when you had the infection, um, it, the, it's called the RAS system, but the RAS system was, was in dysfunction. You couldn't create, what would happen is, is that your body would determine that you have low blood pressure maybe hypovolemic or just uh, uh, hypotensive. And then normally what happens is your body detects that and then sends a signal to your kidneys to produce renin. And renin ends up to convert angiotensogen um, into ang angiotensin one and two. Well, when you, when you need, when, when, and you need angiotensin two to constrict the blood vessels so you have um, higher blood pressure because you're hypotensive. Mm -hmm. So you need to go into hypertensive. So it's contracting the blood vessels 
And um, in addition, it creates aldosterone that's telling the body to uh, absorb sodium. So it increases the uh, blood volume that would also be hypertensive to try to counteract the hypotensiveness that the body's detecting. So these patients couldn't, their RAS system was in dysfunction. They couldn't self-correct. So they, they were hypotensive or what is called orthostatic hypotension. They were standing. So because they were standing, they were losing blood pressure. They couldn't self-correct and they would faint. So, um, so, and I'm like, and so when I was, when I was explaining to her that it, you know, it's not, the, if you didn't have ACE, you couldn't control your blood pressure. And not only that, you've heard of people on, on hypertension medication, right? Yeah. Where if you block ACE receptors or ACE2 inhibitors, which is the chemical that activates the receptor, you know, so you have, you know, you have receptor blockers and you have actual protein blockers to prevent RAS system from activating so you don't increase your high blood pressure. But when she said that ACE receptors didn't exist, it's like you could not control your blood pressure if that was the case. And so the, well, the problem that I'm having with these terrain theorists is that they, even though I'm not trying to put myself on a pedestal, but they didn't go through the educational process like an MD or a DO has to go through to understand the physiology. But yet they're making these broad statements that viruses don't exist. And they well, don't even have the rudimentary understanding to even have these statements. They just say, oh, it's never been isolated, but it was isolated. I mean, there's papers that have been published that show that it was isolated, or there's been photographs made of SARS-CoV-2 docking on ACE2 cells in the lung. But she says, oh, because you had to stain it to make the picture, you modified it, and therefore it's invalid. You can never win with these people because they don't allow for inference. They, it becomes a circular argument. And they blame it on us, that it's our circular argument, not theirs. Do you have a sense, Paul, that people like Ulmer and these, are, are they suffering from a form of mass formation psychosis? Or might it be this is a deliberate narrative that they're they're pumping a narrative well i think it depends on the person like for example kaufman now he's a psychiatrist all right yeah. psychiatrist right now and he's older so mm -hmm. he didn't go through modern molecular biology in pre-med or in undergrad or even in medical school because look, he's post genomic md Mm -hmm. right? So a lot of the biotech that we're being taught in medical school didn't exist when he was in medical school. All right. So he doesn't have that foundation like I had. And I'll become a dinosaur soon. And, you know, a new crop of students will have, mm -hmm. you know, better tools and a better understanding. And that's okay. That's the way science is. But, you know, so a lot of things that he's saying, he doesn't even have formal training on. So that's one problem. The other problem is, is that he's a psychiatrist. So that means that his residency was focused on psychiatric care and pharmacology of psychiatric care and how to, you know, yeah. you know how to do um, psychoanalysis and all this. He didn't go in and learn about, in detail in residency, uh, the physiology or 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 surgery or cardiac treatment or anything like that. All right. He focused on the brain in psychiatry and you know emotions and stuff. Now he did go through obviously a rotational program that all medical students have gone through. So he did in in internal medicine, he did at most eight weeks in the core rotation and maybe right. did a couple of electives, you know, a two or or you know, a two week or a four week elective. So let's say he did a four week elective in internal medicine, all right? Plus an eight week block 
in, in the core rotation. All right. That means he's only had 12 weeks of training in internal medicine, but yet he's going to tell you how it is with viruses. See the, see the kind of like, it's almost as if he was handpicked to be disinformation. That's he was, not my impression. Mm -hmm. That's Kaufman. All right. So, so I think Kaufman, so the point I'm making is it depends on the person we're talking about here. Kaufman seems to be disinformation. He was rolled out on Richie from Boston's uh, channel first. Well, that's a, that's a bunch of flat earthers. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you know, these are people that did not take calculus. These are people that are already programmed to, to, not, to, to not believe any science or very little science or question, you know, any level of academia. A lot of these people that listen to Richie from Boston aren't educated. You know, so I'm not saying everyone's not educated, but what the, it seemed as though it was a perfect rollout for Kaufman to feed the seed into these, what I call the dumbass truthers. You know, these people that just buy in, they're, they're credulous. They're, they just buy into anything they hear. They hear this Dr. Kaufman saying that viruses don't exist, so it must be true. And he shows a picture of an exosome that looks like a virus, but doesn't explain that the chemical composition of that exosome is completely different than any virus that has been isolated. And then they say, well, viruses, have it, that's true, but it, virus has never been isolated. You know, and, you know, and that the means that there's no perfect isolate for, for, for viruses, and that there may be some artifacts within the fluid that, that's holding the isolate, which may be true. There may be some there may not be 100% pure, but when you start using sequencing technologies, you can see the artifact. And then they make these statements like, well, there's these researchers out there that randomly took animal, animal, uh, uh, um, animal um, tissue, cell cultures, and, and mm -hmm. did a sequencing analysis and said they found they found measles and HIV and everything in that animal culture. And you know, if that was the case, and these are common substances that are used in pharmaceutical manufacturing or in vaccine manufacturing that most people have come in contact with, then that would mean that everyone's gonna be coming down with measles. Everyone's gonna be coming down with HIV. That's not the case, right? So, Where's the incidences? But yet they're saying that you can find it everywhere. Well, if it's found everywhere, then why doesn't everyone have it? See, it doesn't, it, for me, it doesn't seem to hold logic. And then they, then what supports their argument is that they say that's because the, the most people, they're in homeostasis naturally. Their frequency is just right. Their, their water frequency is just right in the body. This is sounding more like Star Wars and like, you know, in the force, you know, than, than medicine. Now, maybe medicine will get to that level, you know, because magic, the difference between magic and medicine, all right, is a level of understanding, you know. Um, thank you. Thank you. you know, thank you. You know, like a caveman today would view us as ma magicians, right? They, he, they would look at us and like, you can do all these things. And it seems like magic. Right. Yeah. If we go into the future, if we were teleported in the future, we would consider ourselves, you know, dinosaurs in terms of our understanding of medicine. And they would be the magicians, right? Because they're doing things that just we couldn't fathom. Dr. Paul, I have a question real quick. I mean, you know, today's debate was kind of grueling to listen to because you had two different perspectives which both collided into the same area and it was very what's the word the the the, the language for most of the guests out there that were listening which means the listeners out there was a little bit above grade level for most people you know what i'm saying right, right. and the, the problem i had with her was that she had only two years of medical school and then she went to go to homeopathic studies now 
You and well, I. I'll tell you the reason why. I'll tell you. The I, reason I already, why. I already got the reason. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard. <laughs> it's damn hard, and she couldn't pass. She couldn't pass the. the, the she couldn't pass through the, the testing. And so what happens is, is they drop down to a naturopathic means, and they they think they know it all. But yet, if they knew it all, then why the hell didn't they pass the, pass the the you know the the gates for MD? Medical school is extremely hard. It's the hardest thing I've ever done. And I aced Harvard, aced Harvard. And Harvard is a pretty hard school. I also got a B, an average B at MIT. That's a hard school. And I'm telling you, medical school is way harder than anything I've ever done in my life. Now, maybe it's because I'm doing it, in, you know, in my, you know, doing it in my late 40s, early 50s. And maybe that's it. You know, maybe and maybe I would just find it easier if I was younger. I don't know. But <laughs> medical school is hard. It's a hard. It's grueling and it sucks. And a lot of people just can't. They don't. They, you know, you you've been in the military. You you've seen people that just like okay, they got what it takes to be a Navy SEAL, or they don't have what it takes to be a Navy SEAL. Right. Right. And that's the, that's you know, medical school is kind of like that. Medical school is kind of like Navy SEAL training. And you just got to suck it up, you know, and enjoy the suck. And then, and then eventually, you know, you get through the evolution process and, and then you, you start to understand what's going on in the human body. It doesn't mean that we, you know, because that knowledge is evolving. It doesn't mean that we know it all. And it doesn't mean that what we do know is correct. New knowledge will come in and, 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 and then tell us that we're wrong. Like, for example... SIV was in polio vaccines. That's a fact. The question is how much of that actually exacerbated the, the spread of HIV in the Congo. I suggest that it was a major contributor. It's not the only contributor, but it was a major contributor. And we still have uh, uh, medical science gurus not willing to admit to that. And Jack was you know, making a, a great point. It's not just SIVs. It's other cell cultures and other things that were going on at the time. So um, I'll tell you, you know, Daryl, it sucks. Medical school, going through it as a student sucks. <laughs> and, I, and I'll tell you, I just, I, you know, so when I hear these people that go, well, you just got horse blinds. You got to Dude, do you have any idea what it means to do 10 hours a day, every freaking day, study, 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 test, put all your effort in, and the best you're going to do is barely pass. But that's all you care about to be able to go to the next evolution. That's medical school. They break you down to the point where you just are fully exhausted by the time you roll in for that test. Well, no, you're able to do 10 hours a day studying. Uh, which means you could do a 12-hour shift, and, <laughs> and hopefully you can retain a quarter of what you've learned. I mean, right. you know that. Is, so we have this phrase in medical school: you're going to forget half of what you what you learned in medical school, and the other half is wrong. Right, because you want to learn on learn, the fly. You right, and then you learn by doing in rotation and in, in, in residency. But they try to break. I'm telling you, medical school tries to break. The, the student. It's like boot and camp. So some people don't have a very strong background. It's a boot camp of its own right. class and nature. But the question yeah. I have for you is, you know, when you think about medical school and then you think about, you know, you're the feeding ground for the pharmaceutical agencies. Oh, yeah, I said that out loud. Mm -hmm. If you are the feeding ground for the pharmaceutical agencies to make their money, that will pay you eventually in the end. Um... Don't you see it as a rotating door? Well, yeah. I mean, you know. By right? you can you can play it like how Malone played it. You know, you can invent something, get patents, get you and know, step away from use, the game. Or you know, you can invent a you know a therapy and you know or set up a biotech company. You know, like Malone a lot did. of doors open up if you get through the MD program and. In, it may not necessarily mean that you are a clinician, you may be a researcher, or you may set up a, a biotech company or something. So, you know, but there's a lot of people out there that, you know, they fail out of medicine and they 
and then they they go to the dark side and say all of medicine's bad. And I I could be wrong, but that was kind of the feeling that I was getting from Bulmer. Yes, that's what I, I was getting I too. And that could be I you know I could be wrong. On this, no, I, that's what yeah. I was getting too. I, I saw her as I hate. Well, it's almost like. I did 20 years of homeopathic medicine, and I'm just happy and successful. I have not had any. But you, have you had any real true cases like what we have with the COVID-19? With, right. uh, with yeah, what do you do when a patient is rolling in? They have, you know, a pulse ox of 88. They're starting to go in tachycardia. Well, she said she, uh, she can see, and, you know, and they, she and can look at them until. And you know, and you're they're in the emergency room. What do you do? But you she said she could look oats and, and, and eat berries. That and that doesn't work. Hold on. So you got to you got to use <laughs> allopathic means to stabilize the patient. And so you know that's why I'm saying there's a place for both. There's a place for MDs or DOs. But you have to remember the DO program and the MD program is basically the same. Right. And you know, but there's uh, the you know, and there's the natural way. But it depends on where the patient is at what stage of life and what stage of the disease. Oh. If it's in the early progression or it's a preventative, natural weight means does a lot. Well, you know, a pound of prevention is worth, or, you know, an inch, what was it? An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? Right. So, you know, so there is a, there, there is a place for her in, in that establishment. But for them to, you know, go, go off and, say that viruses don't, you know, don't work and that all of these medical, you know, medical community is all a cabal and, and all that, you know, like, for example, if you're having an, as, an asthma attack and you're hospitalized, you better be given albuterol or you might die. All right. And I don't care it how many the lungs. oats you eat, you know, it ain't going to solve the problem. It opens you the albuterol. lungs. You got to so, have it. So, you know, see, but if Elbura, if, if it wasn't for Big Pharma, Elbura would be there. But then on the other side, they do say salt, water, and steam, but it takes longer. Right. Well, I mean, and it's not, and it's not, it's not controlling. You have muscles around your bronchial tubes, right? And you need to relax them. So the Elbura will relax the, will relax and open up your bronchial tubes so you can get more air in. Correct. So, um, it's a relax, it's a muscle relaxer. Yeah. So, so I, I think it's a beta two agonist. Right. I'd have to double check, but I think it's a it beta is. two agonist. And when you activate the beta two receptor, who she doesn't believe in, she didn't believe in receptor. She didn't believe it. When exists. you activate the beta two receptor, what happens is, is that because it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, uh, um, bronchial dilating and it'll open up They'll open up the the bronchial tubes. I wonder how she so would it's treat very, it's, fa it's fast acting. That's the thing is it's fast acting Not, because you're in a crisis situation, right? But so uh, there's you know so when you're in a crisis situation, or let's say you're bleeding out, mm. you know because of a, a you know some sort of farm act. seaweed. <laughs> You know, you know, seaweed. Come and, on, Dr. Paul. Go get yeah, some seaweed I, and wrap it around you. Yeah, right. You know, so, I mean, it's like. Where are you going to get the seaweed from? And and the thing <laughs> is, is that when she was saying that SARS-CoV-2 doesn't exist. That's kind of upsetting. You know, and I'm like, I'm already still, you know, in la-la land in terms of what happened to my mom. You were just you know? at the research facility doing that study in right, an undisclosed so, location. In an un undisclosed location, but... um you know, but the thing is, and it so happens on the, where I was at. Got locked where, down. It, it, well, where I was at, you know, there was a lockdown. But but the thing is, where I was at, um, just uh, in the facility and in other buildings down the road, they were doing primate research. I can't tell you what it was, but I'm telling you, my, how do I want to phrase this? Your HIV studies is going my, to no, pay no, my, off. How do I want to phrase this? My travels in academia in, for the pursuit of medicine 
have put me in a position to see a lot of amazing things. And I'm not at liberty to say yet what was going on, but I'm telling you, when I say I have insider information, I have insider information. And so when I'm talking to Dr. Volmer and she's telling me, you know, this stuff, uh, you know, I'm like going, you have no fucking idea what you're talking. But I, you know, I want her to swear. Yeah, you did say, say that twice, Dr. Paul. Did I swear? Yeah, you swore. Said, where the fuck you get this? <laughs> <laughs> I was but like, it was my act. It was no, because she laid really the. Try, I was really trying to control myself. She, she laid the know. smack down on you twice, though, and during the show. Okay, she goes, did, did she? yeah, she got you twice. You got to really listen. She got you twice, though. I got to give her credit, though. She got you, though, because I thought you were gonna pop. Well, the well, I don't know. I mean, I, I would have to because I didn't prepare. I know you didn't I just prepare went in cold at all. Turkey. I went cold turkey, and she did the, you know, the speech and all that crap. I got the you proof know, of that. You know, so I just, I just, all I did was, you know, I went in cold turkey, and I just was having a discussion. I thought I was just, I thought I was debating someone else. I didn't realize it was her until last minute. Well, you know, something but, you did a good job. But the thing is, is, um, well, I, I think that Donald Trump, the way that in the yeah, public. People would be, Paul, why are you bringing Donald Trump in? There's a correlation. All right. there, there, there's an association. Donald Trump, genius of, for the debates, was not the prepare. Because the whole idea is just throw whatever you want and I'll react. Right. But if I, if I practice what I think you're going to give me and you give me something different, then everything starts to fall apart. And you notice so she was better practice. off going in unprepared as long as you're knowledgeable of the subject. And you notice that she came in practice because her closing yeah. statement was a written write-up. Yeah, yeah. And she, but her opening and closing statement. Yeah, it and, was. And, you know, I, I don't know. May, may, I, do you think overall, you, you, don't, you can hurt my feelings. I'm going to hurt your feelings. All right, but, but <laughs> do you think overall, <laughs> overall she won the debate or I won the debate? Um, I no think one? it was a draw because... At one point, she was taking the lead. She was laying the look. She had you in the. She was getting ready to hit you with a diamond cutter, boy. She said, "This is a high five. And, and and you came back and blocked her, and, and and you gave her a super kick, pow, and she went down. And then she went psycho Sid on you, and hit you with a power bomb, right? And then I saw you stand back up, you, like the Undertaker, and you you kept coming, and you kept coming. She couldn't keep pinning you. She tried to pin you separate. She couldn't do it. I called a tie. So what, what areas, the two areas that I, you think I failed? Where you, where, the, the, the reason why it became a tie was because you blended the men together at the end. You showed how they work together better well, I think than that's separate. The truth. That's the truth. I really believe that because of, you know, if you control inflammation on a lot of disease processes, you reduce the, 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 the disease progression. And, and I think guys. that's the beauty of natural path because it's that you try to control the inflammation. And the so, but that doesn't mean that allopathic medicine is all for not. Well, hold on. You have to remember. I mean, how do you beat an old shaman with with modern medicine? Yeah. I but mean, that old shaman is going to know it. every trick but in the book. There's something to be learned from the old shaman. Yeah, there's a lot to be learned. Even natural medicine better learn from the old shaman because he's been through the the the, right. the years of knowledge and training. He's got training knowledge that came before him, and he's going to have to pass his on to someone else. Well, here's another thing that naturopathics don't accept. You know, if you're going into surgery, you better hope that your anesthesiologist is a good anesthesiologist. Oh, shoot. You don't shoot. want to be awake, right? So if Big Pharma is so bad and so wrong with receptors, how the hell does anesthesiology well, to have see the point, see, 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 see it. But the thing is, is that that platform that I was debating on, my style is that the moment they say something stupid, I interject. Right. I can't. I'll tell you. You can't. I don't have the patience to wait for ten freaking minutes while you start bitching. You are. You spill your bullshit at me. <laughs> I mean, it's rare. To, to, to sit back and watch you be a little patient, you know what I mean? The right. bottom so line I'm is... I'm a little bit more, I, I'm, I'm kind of reactive when I see... That's why I wanted to parse each sentence out. Right. 
you because want i don't believe i you know but the thing is is that when you're listening to some of the 10 minutes you forget the first five minutes bs and you're only focused on the last 10 minutes the right. last five minutes of the bs so um I don't know, I'm, but I do believe that there there's a synergy between them. There is that is very important, but yeah. I don't find that as a failure of the debate. Her main point that was real was this: if the body is at perfect harmony without the inflammation, your yeah. levels are perfect. You're not yeah. going to be sick. That's not true. But because that's not true. Say, you, wait, 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 if you're in perfect harmony, all right. You know, and your internal sick. organs, everything. And, yeah, yeah, you're perfectly in harmony. You're, you're, you know, and and you are. The, there's always an uncontrollable HIV. variant. You're in, in, in Let's say, let's say you're in. You're variable. Injected with HIV, you're gonna get HIV, right? Or you have a higher. You, let me phrase it in probab probabilistic terms. You have a much higher probability of getting HIV. Yes. So, you know, and sh she's basically saying, no, that's just disrupting the, the internal processes. Well, why don't she, why don't she put it? Well, it is uh, disrupting the internal processes because it's causing infection. Well, hold on. She's not saying that the cause of right. that infection is because of the disruption of your... I mean, it, I, I, to me, it seems like... It was stupid. I, I felt like I was talking to... To... Uh, a 12 year old, you know, the VP, no, the VP, <laughs> okay, you know, our VP. Oh, like, Harris, like, oh, like she's a dumb as a bag of bricks, it was, anyway. like a, it was like a word sale, you know. And I'm like, going, Are you kidding me here? So, I don't know, I don't, I'm not gonna watch it, rewatch it, I'll, I'll replay it on different, different channels, I yeah. Mean, but, watch it. but my memory is, is that every time I felt as though. She you were getting dumber by the moment, moment, weren't you? <laughs> I wasn't able to rebut at the moment that she said it. So I lose momentum in being able to counteract. I knew you wanted to destroy it, but the bottom line, I mean, honestly, on, on this side of the network, if you had done that, it would have been, okay, you're free. And I just close well, the mic yeah. and walk away. <laughs> right, 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 right. You know, the thing is, is that you know, I think her strongest position was is that in many research studies, um, maybe uh, not perfect controls were, were there to definitively state certain conclusions. But there are reasons for that. And a lot of that is because of funding. So well, you cut corner, you cut corners, in, you know, to be able to do the experiment. So you don't have all the positive and all the negative controls in a perfect experiment. All right. My because question. Because you're trying, you're, you know, and so what you do is you do an inference and you're building up from previous knowledge. Um, and that you, you know, you're inferring from that previous knowledge and, and carrying the, carrying the experiment forward. The because, you know, everything is cited. You know, right. The, these people did this, and so we are expanding it to, to go in this direction. So you're heavily reliant on previous work to um, prove. You know. Your... So, but but the thing is, is that that doesn't mean that it's invalid. Oh, we got more people um, hopping in now, Doctor yeah. Paul. My statement is this: maybe the listeners out there need to understand how much it costs to do an experiment. And we're going to talk about from your point of view, where you were when you were at that undisclosed location and you had your mice. It was rats. I mean, yeah, rats. Okay, rats. Right. Oh, they're, they're little cute little buddies, okay? They're friendly. Well, I'll tell you what. You know, you know I, I had to sacrifice them, you know, in my Yeah, you hand. did. And I'll tell you. And, you know, and, and, you know, took the, you know, the different tissues and the organs out. But I'll tell you... Um, I feel sad, actually, from it. You know, I just, you know, these these were creatures that I actually had to sacrifice to do the research. So, and at that time, on a hot my, tarmac. <laughs> yeah, but you know the thing. Yeah, but you know, at the time, this was when my father was diagnosed with ischemic dementia. 
So yeah. I feel like 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 bad karma was ha- coming from the research, and you know, and my father, you know, started to, you know, have his problem, and then the downward spiral with my mother. And then yeah, you wanted to be. Kind of, it, it was nigger, really, nigger, it was nigger. a really weird time period for me. So, um, you know, it's sad, but I, you know, when these terrain theorists say that it's never been isolated, and that oh, it hasn't been verified through all these all these, um, you know, postulates, you know, that it causes disease, uh, you know, and a lot of these experiments are done in vitro. The thing is, is you got an ethical problem. You can't take the isolate. You can't take the isolate and, well, this guy is an idiot. This is stupid. You know, uh, you got trolls. Yeah, well, you know, this guy is an idiot. Hey guys! Yo, nice dick. Hey guys! Uh, you want to have fun and block them? Yeah. Hey uh, guys! Gotta, you know this. You know you got these people that are just clowns. Mm-hmm. Hey guys! Come on. Uh, I'm gonna deal with clowns today. Yeah, I just hide not enough central people. Now they don't look smart. You know, the thing is, is that people need to be more respectful of of conversation. And I think it's funny. Uh, now we got Johnny. Hold on. Trunk brigade. No retards. They're just retarded. You know, people are retarded. They want to act. They want to act like Im- imbeciles. Well, it's okay, a lack so, of intelligence that you're discovering. I mean, mm-hmm. people mm-hmm. are no. What happens is this: they act like children, and then in the end, they need to go to a doctor. And Lord and behold, maybe one day it's you. Yeah, maybe I don't know. I'll, we'll you know cross that bridge when it when we get to it. But um, I think the. I think the remind me what the point I was making before I was interrupted. You know, my brain's blown too. I think that I think that. Yes. Do you want to say something? Who who's talking? Who, uh, does does someone want to ask a question? It'll be. Uh... Which one? Debbie Olson or Marcus? No, Debbie already answered the question. Okay. Ken is just listening. Jack's so it's good. Jack. So it's no. Marcus. So Marcus, do you have a question? He's a hey guys. Marcus, do you have a question? Okay. So, um, so I think. Um, I think the point I was making with Dr. Bulmer was that you know she had a, a, a very strong focus on, well, you know, these things are being done in vitro and it hasn't been proven to cause disease in vivo. So therefore is it's there's not adequate test to say that it exists. And um, I disagree. I think the power of infer inference is 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 a big component of scientific endeavor. Um, And that, you know, when she started, you know, moving into the realm that the the pathogens don't, don't cause disease or don't manifest disease because they, you know, provide a certain pathogenic load to a group of people and they didn't get infected well, that means that they didn't break tolerance. So there's something in, in animal research, we had to break tolerance to cause the disease, Daryl. So, um, you know, so if you didn't give, if you didn't give the P2 protein to the rats that we were experimenting on at high enough doses, it wouldn't break tolerance and they wouldn't create antibodies against P2 that would lead to, um, that would lead to uh, 
uh, disease. So you had, you know, and create the antibodies, right? You had to produce, you had to give a lot of P2 protein to these animals to break tolerance. And not only that, you had to give them an adjuvant to cause the inflammatory response. So, so, so most likely what Vollmer was saying in these studies, it wasn't breaking tolerance in these, in these, in these animal studies, or when you do things that are in vitro, you're not fully capturing everything that's going on in the body. And this is why a lot of cancer research wants to move away from in vitro. I try to make this statement, but we were interrupted uh, during the debate. Um, you know, I was making this point that in, in vitro analysis of, of, of some types of cancer processes can't be fully captured because there is a much more complex orchestrated cascade of events that are taking place in vivo in the body. It's, it's taking place in the body and it's much more complex than the simplicity of an in vitro study. So, you know, so, but you can get some understanding of modes of action by doing these in vitro studies because sometimes in vivo studies ethically can't be done. Sometimes mm. it's cost prohibitive. Sometimes it's regulatory prohibitive. Sometimes it's, you can't get patients to, I mean, do you want to be a patient to do medical, you know, experimentation? Obviously, not, right? You have to already have a disease and you have to, you know, probably be a stage four, you know, cancer patient or something to be, you know, qualify for the clinical trials. So there's a lot of problems with doing in vivo, in vivo studies that quote would be definitive to prove, uh, you know, a certain pathogenic response to, a, you know, to a certain pathogen, right? So, you know, some of these things that she's saying, it's just like, you can't do, but the power of inference is, is science. I think that was kind of like a, a, an underlying theme that wasn't teased out during the debate. Um, and that for people that say that it's never been pictured, and I've stated papers that stated that it was pictured, and she goes, well, it's been modified because of staining. Um, you know, you can never win because now you're taking stuff out of the body and you have to preserve it, right? So, and there are techniques to try to preserve it. But that doesn't mean that what you're picturing, you can't learn from because that paper that I was showing showed the actual docking of the SARS-CoV-2 onto the ACE2 receptor. But yet she doesn't believe the ACE2 receptors exist nor that SARS-CoV-2 exists. Well, the problem... And that, that is an artifact of the process. Right. But yet if you can take, if, it, if it's an artifact of the process, but yet you can take that, those viruses and sequence them and they match SARS-CoV-2 not measles, not HIV, not, you know, some other virus, but the SARS-CoV-2, then I can infer that that docking on ACE2 was done by an ACE2, uh, it, done by the spike protein on SARS-CoV-2. So, you know, science is through inference. And so I think that was a, another, a, another hole in her, in her, logic saying that viruses don't exist or you know receptors don't exist i mean it, she would i think that she lost credibility when she said that receptors didn't exist yeah i did too from i the I, I, I i just like what the hell i did I mean, from the get-go yeah i mean the way the exosomes communicate partially not always but partially is because it creates an actual um an ant an antigen in the Golgi apparatus to be able to communicate to a receptor somewhere else in the body. So if receptors didn't exist, exosomes wouldn't be able to communicate. Well, I honestly believe she lost a lot of credibility when she said that, number one, I, she started out with, I uh, had two years of medical school and then went to homeopathic. And that was the point where I said, hold on, you're talking about science versus nature. I mean, 
Okay, Marcus. I'll tell you. I don't understand why they're, they're so boring. Bad. They're kids. I don't understand. They're the, retarded they're so kids, and they just troll. And you know, I, I don't understand why they're so retarded. Well, I mean, it's yeah, the I mean, society that you it have. The, it's the society. I, I mean, think about it. Look at what you got. Maybe the order is right, and they should just die. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe there needs to be calling in the, in the population because of how many stupid people. I uh, mean, the, the problem is, you know, what should I say? humanity what should, should be say? sitting there and say, we, we, the people deserve life. Humanity says that people deserve to experience. But you know something? There's a point where you start saying, you know, something, I'm joining the NWO and I want all you sons of bitches down because you're a bunch of idiots. I mean, you woke up and you found yourself stupider than you were before. That's why you sit in your mother's basement, twiddling your thumb, and have something stuck square up your asses. Because you don't want to learn. Sorry, I had to say that. You don't want to learn something. You just want to drift on through. I mean, it's disappointing that medical concerns don't concern you. But when something happens, it's going to be something that's going to be traumatic. It's going to end your life. And where are you going to turn to without no knowledge? Where are you going to turn to with no knowledge? Think about it. You couldn't even stop your own child who slit their wrist. Why? Because you were so dumb, you didn't know what to do because you weren't listening to the man who told you, hey, there's a homopathic way and there's a medical way. You couldn't save your child who overdosed because why? You're so dumb because you weren't listening to the man talking about what it takes to heal you or to stop this person from dying from overdose. You could have asked him. You had the moment to ask him. And 12 minutes later, guess what happened? Your close friend decides to OD and right beside you. And you had a doctor right there. And guess what? You're going to say, oh, Dr. Control, what happened? What would I do? Block, delete. <laughs> That's one down, you some bitch. All right. I mean, hey, you know something? You thought it was troll. Block, delete. Is it that simple, Doc? Well, I wish life was that simple. You know, it's a little bit easier. Well, see, I can do life. block delete for you if you want. <laughs> well, you know, it's just like, you know, it's, it's, I don't know, Jack, I mean, you know, you're still listening, hopefully, you know, maybe you can chime in and tell me, you know, what's your perspective on, you know, you're with radio and stuff and talking to different, different people. What, what's your perspective on these trolls, you know, they just, and their retardedness. I have good trolls around me. These guys are oh, helpful. Oh, okay. What do you so say, what do you Jack? Think, Jack? Well, I think what you got here, you, it sounds like you got kids playing. Um, but Old there kids. Are, yeah, they're just, I, I think they're just kids that are out trolling, having fun. That's what it sounds like. But, um, but my concern more is what appears to be a real troll army. And I, I believe they're coming from several sources. Uh, of course, you've got the CCP. Mm -hmm. You probably got, you know, domestic trolls. Uh, mm -hmm. I know someone who was involved pretty high in in an intelligence agency. But Jack, a lot of them are right here, homegrown, right here in America, brother. I can tell you for a fact that I made friends with the troll base from the Art Bell era, and they were numerous. Right. I mean, they were huge numbered. And, yeah, I was at war with them for a while. Now we family. They respect me. Now, these trolls that are coming out now, they're not CCP. Believe me, they're not. These trolls are right here in the U.S., and they are also well organized by the U.S., and I've met a bunch of them that want. Who do you think is behind these people? Who is behind that? 
that group. You know something? That would be one funny thing to say. You remember back in the Obama era when they had opened up the uh, computer room in downstairs, let's say, but no, it was in the back corner of the Oval Office area, uh, where they were having the um, people come in. Uh, that's when the really real trolling started, real bad. I mean, real bad. I mean, I'm from the days of, you know, BBS. I've been through it all. I've seen it, done it, been through it all. And Do I, you remember CompuServe? Oh man, CompuServe! Oh my <laughs> God! Why? Why? Why are you going to make my? I, I was I was an early adopter of CompuServe. Hold on, I still got three point five. There was there was there was a there was kind of a, a BBS kind of thing going on called Genie. Yes, Genie was cool. Yeah, G, so Genie and CompuServe. Um, but those were like my Commodore sixty four six hundred baud days. Oh, I remember Netscape too. I still That's, got a Netscape yeah, account. Yeah. I wonder if it's still active. <laughs> I don't know. But don't know. no, but these, I, these trolls. I saw a lot of trolls. You know, I, I think Jack's right, though. There's like diff there's different groups of trolls. You know, there was these, this troll group that, you know, we, we coined the phrase, we, we coined the, the term, um, the 10 cent trolls. Oh, that's what you just had. You know, and then, no, they, we were considering the 10 cent trolls were the CCP. Um, no, they're not. And then, you know, and that you know, and then you got these. Then you got. It seems like there's a group that's coming out of Europe. Yes. That's happening. So I think there's a group that's coming out of Asia. There's a group that's coming out of Europe. I'm not sure if it's Western Europe or Eastern Europe. I, a lot of times they're, they're um, Eastern Europe that most Looks likely. like it's in Spanish, so I, so I'm assuming it's Western. Europe. Um, and then you have a group that's in the United States. I think the group that's in the United States are just, I think the far majority of them are just young, young individuals that are just being stupid. Or some old schoolers are sitting down there, got nothing to do in their mother's basement, sucking on lollipops and imagining well, they were having I friendships. Know. I don't know. But there, I'm sure that the United States, through the NSA, has a group that trolls, but I'm not so sure if. That, you know, maybe their trolling is a little different. It is. Maybe it's, it's more like surveillance and not so much trolling. I mean, think about it. You just had literally five people hop into your show to disrupt it because of a truth that you're speaking. The questions that you're asking, the answers you're giving. I mean... You know, the it, sad thing is, is this, you know, and, and I know it's wrong for me to say this, especially how we're trained in medical school to be not so biased. But, you know, this is roughly the third month, uh, you know, of my mother passing from yeah. SARS-CoV-2. All right? And I'm like going, why did she get killed off earlier than she should have been? Because of something that Fauci funded and Barrick made. Well, there are kids like that that have an opportunity to make a better world, but yet are being stupid. And so, you know, I want retribution. I want justice. And I don't think it's wrong to say, even though I probably get in trouble for saying this, you know, in medical school, but I don't think it's wrong from saying that my mother should have lived longer and these kids should have died. Why did they survive? But yet, they're piles of shit. There's nothing worth saving. But yet my mother had to die the way she did, you know, through this SARS-CoV-2 infection that ended up having cardiac arrest earlier than she should have. And I would have been able to speak to her one last time. You know, I was hoping that I would be able to see her after the semester was up knowing that she was ailing in, in the nursing home. Obviously, that didn't happen. I couldn't do that because she died too early. Mm -hmm. You know, but you have these kids making disruptions and they don't even look in the mirror and realize that they have an opportunity to make a, the world a better place, but yet they act like a bunch of retards. But you got the person 
myself, that was trying to inform the public of an existential threat to their family. But yet it was my mother that died from SARS-CoV-2. I bet you why, you, I, why did I spend all the time that I did to hmm. sacrifice and put my reputation on the line to help these cocksuckers? Really, why did, why did, why the, the stuff that I'm doing, you know, in terms of medical research, in terms of informing the public of my understanding of what's going on with SARS-CoV-2, to try to help them, only for a big part of society, not the majority, but a big part of society that doesn't deserve to live. You're telling they the don't truth. deserve to live. You're telling the so, truth. You know, tell, tell me where I'm wrong, Jack. I mean, what I mean, so I'm in a space where I saw my mother die earlier than she should have because of a weapons program that came out of Barrick's lab. But yet you have people like the trolls out there that are being thankful that they were able to weather the storm of this crisis and live another day. I don't, Paul, quite frankly, after battling these guys. I, to me, they're, they're no more important, I think Mao said it best, no more important than a dog's bark. Um, and yeah, but the dog know, barks, and it can be very annoying. Dog's bark. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the dog's no, bark. I, I think that, you know, they're a distraction, and uh, maybe there's a point there to it. Why it is, um, you know, why are they like that? Well, they're victims. I think most of them are victims. You know, the kids and the people like, and even the people that are, that are doing this at a professional level, they're victims creating victims. Uh, you know, and you're doing what you believe is best. Um, you know, I, it's, it's tragic that you lost your mother in that way. I did as well. Um, I was, you know, and, and, and there was a lot of guilt that I had to, to deal with over that, what I could have done, should have done. Um, mm -hmm. And that was a paralysis. And, uh, you know, I, uh, it, took, it took a while to see that, but I was stronger as a result. And I think you will be stronger as a result when you, when you understand that, You know, what you're doing in medicine, uh, a lot of it is dealing with injustice. Um, no, and and, and that's, that's what real warriors do. They deal with injustice. And in order to do that effectively, you, you can't be given in, you, you can't be distracted or, or, or let that get into you. Um, that, that that's why I yeah, yeah I it's, you know it, you know yeah I don't know I mean I didn't know that you lost your parents too or your mother um I don't you know I just I don't know it's it's a strange space to be in it really is a strange space and if I was to roll back the clock and go I'm going to do that first video to inform the public on what I saw about the, the copy paste and the genome you know, and then mm -hmm. eventually led to Dr. Xi's research in, in P4 yeah. to show that it was man-made. I don't know if I would have done it, Jack, over again. Why? I think I would have been quiet and just, because I, I, the, the blowback from the institutions, you know, Harvard and my medical school, which are two different oh, institutions, yeah. but you know, that blowback was pretty severe. Yeah. And my long-term reputation, you know, you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to be going into residency one day, or being interviewed for residency, hoping to get into a residency program. And I'm not sure if me sounding an alarm to try to save people is going to hurt that or help it. And some, some people will see me as as a, as a prior. Some people will see me as a, you know, some sort of savior or some sort of hero. You know, and I was trying to do the right thing. And then you get the, you know, these, these trolls and you get, you know, you're going to also see as 
as the echo of SARS-CoV-2 goes away, as we're going into the endemic phase, the crisis leaves our memory. There's going to be a forced narrative by the government and, and myself and many others that have been covering SARS-CoV-2 like we have been are going to be, that must have been an Alex Jones conspiracy theory because they are trying to rewrite history. I think, that's, I think that was a big part of why Nature, in their correspondence paper that was edited by Fauci, tried to push the zoonotic theory on SARS-CoV-2. Right. It was because they're setting in motion that when this does go away, that there was plausible deniability from EcoHealth, plausible deniability of P4, plausible deniability with, with Fauci's department, at the NIH, and uh, you know, it's not a coincidence that that the head of the NIH decided to retire and go to his genomic laboratory. You no, know? because he was in on it too within the emails that were leaked out from Fauci. Both, both, um, um, I, I forget his name right now. Uh, that was the head of the NIH, but but. Um, he was one of the four researchers for the genome project, human genome project. But um, you know, Fauci and him in the emails that were leaked from, from Fauci's server yeah. show that the head of the NIH was concerned about the, the media and they were trying to that they were internally were trying to control the narrative to make sure that they push the zoonotic theory and not the lab, not the lab leak theory. So there was concerted effort at the highest levels of the NIH to try to hide the truth. That much was um, obvious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Well, Paul, I, I think it's a greater. You know, we have to look at the greater good. Um, I lost, as a matter of fact, I lost my mother, and and a lot due to blowback from something I did that, as a part of my work in, in media and some involvement in politics. Uh, I, I had a lot of blowback. And at the time, I didn't know if it was, I knew that there would be blowback, but there was a greater good behind it. And, you know, perhaps some, I don't want to bore everybody here with this. And probably some things I shouldn't share at this point, but, I wouldn't do that. I, I mean, if I had it to, if I could go back and say, I, w and not do that and end up better than where I am today, I couldn't do it. Um, now, you probably have a bit more to sacrifice where you are at. So I would look at where, where does the greater good lie? Um, and I also think that you know, what you did was very important in going out on a, on a limb like that in the beginning. It was essential. It had to be done. Um, I, 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 I was privy to some information in 2019. And when all this started unfolding, I could not sit back. I knew that I would be labeled an idiot, a crank, a fool, but I knew with enough certainty what was going on that I, I had to press it. And at this point, I don't have a lot left to lose. So, you know, in, in my case, it, it, it was, I, I had no choice but to, to push forward with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the, in Judaism, you know, not to make this a religious thing, but, you know, in Judaism, it says that if you see a hole that someone dug and someone falls in it, you're responsible for not warning the individual that fell in it, even though you didn't dig the hole. So it was my quote duty to inform the public of an existential threat that I saw. Right. You know, the problem is, is that by warning the public, it is potentially have, has hurt my medical career going forward. Well, you know, and then, you know, and then, so I, I don't know. And, it, and how this gets all whitewashed and we turn into a pariah, this is why it's so important that I'm trying to preserve the record and doing shows like this 
and spreading it on different channels, not just my channels. So there's an, there is a silicon footprint of the conversation of what was happening at the time of the events. Because I think holding some sort of historical record is very important to be able to shine a light on the whitewashing that the government will be doing. I mean, they're whitewashing 9-11. Right, they're trying. They're, they're trying to scrub 9/11 quote research or coverage by the alt news community. Same thing's going to happen in SARS CoV two. You know, and uh, you know, I don't know if I'll have the energy when you know the fifth cocktail gets released. Like for example, you know, I'm I'm exhausted from medical school, right? But in the news recently, I'm not sure who told me this. I'm not sure if it was Daryl that told me or someone else. Well, maybe it was Daryl, that they, there is a uh, bird flu has been found. Yes, uh, yes. First case, right? Well, um, when you do the multiplexing that Dr. Vollmer believes doesn't work, mm-hmm. but if you do the PCR multiplexing and you start hearing cases of, of influenza and positive SARS-CoV-2 cases, that's the fourth cocktail release signature. So we're moving into a realm where we may actually start to see the beginnings of the fourth cocktail. I don't know if I have the energy to cover this, Jack. I mean, it's like, you know, how much can I take? Well, you have to look at your bandwidth too. There's there's the historical perspective and and this. We may be on the verge of a fourth cocktail being released. Well, and as SARS-CoV-2 is dying down, a three cocktail, all of a sudden bird flu starts to become potentially a problem. Yeah. You know, these 100 year events are now becoming every three year events. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, don't, <laughs> you know? don't we have to, to look at that when we see these events and these things, don't we have to look at this, the potential severity of that and the context that they're in and, and they're just not, a, a red herring or their disinformation or confusion. Yeah, yeah, you know, that's, that's, what, that's the thing. what you've done is you've separated the the noise from from the real content that what matters. And and that's what that's what you have to do in if you want to be effective in communication and especially in media, is you have to separate that noise from the point of fact and you, you have to present it in a way that resonates with the audience, whether it be entertainment or, or whatever. And that's what works. Plain facts, I, I've seen that in, in radio, plain facts, people with the truth, it doesn't sell. People don't, re- it doesn't resonate. But somebody like Michael Savage, it's entertaining, it's engaging, and then you can slip the truth in. Um, now there's other things that are serious, you know, like what you're talking about with this fourth and fifth cocktail. That's, I don't see anything any more important than than public awareness of that. Yeah, but I'm exhausted from the war with the free cocktail. Yeah, I mean, just yeah. to get to this point, Jack has been a has been a a, a a a it's like climbing a mountain. It's like climbing Mount Everest. Well, you got you know, to just it. to this point, and it's like I, you know, someone else needs to take the baton and just run with what I you know I don't know I I think that we're moving to the point where and it it's not just the health issue it's the constitutional loss of civil liberties issue yeah. you know that we're talking about our way of life ending oh yeah you know and you know it's not just it not just our civil liberties it's all the the economic structure is starting to break down so you know, well, what component uh, of this, Paul, does what component does any resentment you might have figure in with this with this fatigue and, and that? Because that burns up a lot of energy. Yeah, I think part of it is just medical school dry, grinds you down. Yeah, that's a big part of it. You know, I'm in the I'm in the hardest part of the, the four year training right now. Yeah. And that's that transition from what we call medical sciences and the, the, um, the dedicated study to step. 
step one, we have to take three licensing exams plus our shelf exams. But well, but you know that that first step exam is really really hard, and once you get through this period, then you're more it's more hands on. Yeah. And I think a lot of the really cool, the really interesting things in medicine come out in your third and fourth year. Mm -hmm. But this period that I'm in right now is extremely physically and mentally taxing. And this is the make or break. Yeah. And a lot of people get broken. You know, a lot of people break at this point. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm feeling the fatigue from that, but I'm also feeling the fatigue of covering SARS-CoV-2 for two and a half years. Yeah. And I think I've contributed quite a lot. I've met oh, yeah. interesting people like yourself and Daryl and many others. And, you know, have been, you know, um, connected with a, a, a larger group of intellectuals. Mm -hmm. But there's, you know, there's that in some cases of being a pariah. Like, for example, when my professors, you know, see me, you know, in class, they know who I am. You know, I'm not just a student, a medical student. They know who I am. He's like a celebrity. This whole, this whole, this whole yeah. And, the th and then there's students that come up to me and they go, we know who you are, Paul. You know, they, they go, Dr. Paul, we know who you are, Dr. You know. uh, are you met with? No, so, you know, and then, and then I had I had a student that came up. It was last semester. It was the first year, and he came up to me. He goes, "I saw you with Stefan Melanie when you were doing the show about against China, case against China, which was groundbreaking because you know we were showing in detail what happened at P four. Right. This was about the same week that that." Um, I think it was Epoch Times came out with their documentary about P4. So a lot was a lot of interesting things were happening. And then my conversations with George Webb, my conversations with Cliff High and 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 Mikevitz and and um, and Malone and many many others. Um, so well, I felt you... like I felt like I've been writing a diary of the experience of SARS-CoV-2 and and in a more open platform. Um, and I've tried to help people as much as I can, but I'm worn out, Jack. I, to be honest, I'm worn out. But I think there are multiple reasons why I'm worn out. There's that emotional side of me with, with my mom. I mean, I'm still grieving from that. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's, there's it's, the yeah. being worn out from medical school and being worn out and covering this crisis. I went through something very similar years ago when I lost my mother and, and I got to the point to where I had to prioritize. And I was lucky at the time because I had, I was involved with some pretty, with some people who had been through that their whole life. Uh, and, and they were professionals, they dealt with that. And I was able to separate with, from the emotional component of it, and that released a lot of energy. First, you know, first is what was coming to grips with with the guilt and all these things that we 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 all have to do, and then working through it and going forward, you know, it became easier to to compartmentalize that. And you know, when you're a passionate person and you care about things, it's very it's easy to get roped into this this trap. It's into a where you cannot, um, where all you become drained, you become tired, you, you're worn down. Um, and, and I would pick my battles if this is what's important to make or break. Um, if it's the next six months, year, whatever, I would I would give that my priority. I would go through it. Um, I might be able to, ha I might have some resources here to where we could help you with some of it, you know, where we get some, some assistance and, and to build something with, with, with a group of people. That, that's what we had at the, at the you know, in, in radio and in the network, we, we had a group of supportive of, of individuals who, I every to like a wolf pack we had a wolf pack that was you know that supported each other but we also had support 
at the highest levels of government and also in uh, you know in the media and the public um, now that's been strategically decimated and and removed that 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 mechanism and and what we had then that's that by design has been pretty well debased yeah. uh, but but if you have a strategic alliance, when you're out there by yourself and you're just one man, it, it's it's difficult. It's easy to take you out. You're not alone. No, I mean, you know, I'm around many, you know, important people and, and many, yeah. you know, uh, many individuals that have been supportive emotionally. Yeah. Um, so that's important. You know, Daryl's one of them. But, you know, the thing is, is that, um, you know, I... I'm just worn out. This this whole process is worn out. You're still grieving. That's your problem. And yeah, I'm telling you, like he said, you got to shut off the emotions, man. Let me tell you something. Uh, you you remember how hype I was and how hungry I was to always be on the air, to always tell the truth, get the people to understand the facts, the truth, the real life stuff. Well, right. you know something. I, I noticed that I was so emotional that I was trying to feed these people information. And during COVID, especially, because I wanted people to know what's really going on, know the facts, the truth, know what's going on at the Capitol building while the people are running around and the people are just opening doors for them to walk in. I wanted people to know. That's how much of an investigative reporter I was. I wanted them to know. I had Dr. Paul on air sitting here talking about what was going on with COVID. And I'm getting strikes upon strikes upon strikes on my YouTube. Deleting the YouTube. Creating a new YouTube. Getting rid of this new. Getting a new YouTube. I was so emotional. But guess what? When I cut all those emotions out, went Vulcan. You're a Vulcan? I went Vulcan, brother. <laughs> the Vulcan Odin. <laughs> right. Yes, I, I went Vulcan. Stop caring. I stopped. I said, you know something? The mission can still be complete without the feelings. I've lost, during COVID, about 24 people. Yeah, Close I, to I me. Am, yeah, that's, I, I don't know anyone really. No, it'd be anyone. worse. I'll be honest with you. It'd be worse during, during that emotional time period. If it was my mom. Well, I, I don't know. I don't or think you were. I don't think you were watching my channel in the early days, Daryl. But maybe Jack was. I'm not sure. But there, but, Ron Taylor was was a, someone early on that was talking about nano silk, and how it was. It helped with neutralizing pathogens. Yes. So I there's remember. some legal things that I just can't say, but I think that people can read in between the lines on what I'm saying. So, and Ron was one of the vendors of the laboratory that I'm affiliated with, with selling NanoSolar. This is not a commercial, but the, the thing is, is that he fell in the, in the realm of, of uh, he wasn't like a pure terrain theorist. He was older. He was in his 70s. And he was a smart guy. He, I, I believe he graduated from, from Cornell. You know, so he was Ivy League, and he was a very smart guy, and I I enjoyed talking to him. But you know, he was a little bit more on the energy thing, you know, and you know, he was a little bit more in the realm of Dr. Volmer, but not pure. He wasn't a purist at all. Now, he decided not to take the vaccine. My mother was forced to take the vaccine because she was in the nursing. Yeah. Okay? So, um, but Ron decided not to take the vaccine and just, you know, focus on, you know, homeopathic means. He ended up getting COVID and he was hospitalized in December. He sent me a text because I was regularly talking to him because he was taking my orders for the laboratory. He was my vendor. So I would talk to him once a week, sometimes two or three times a week. And so he told me he was in the hospital and that, you know, he, he contracted SARS-CoV-2. I asked him if he was oh, vaccinated yeah. and he said that he was not vaccinated and that his pulse ox was, was just below 94, 
we want to be at about 98. So, you know, he was in kind of a danger zone. And then about 12 days in, so he was hospitalized for quite a long time. Um, 12 days in, he was starting to get a little bit better, um, but he was having some breathing problems. So this is near the end of December. And he sent me a text asking if I wanted to place an order and I was going to wait until the beginning of the year. So I reach out and find out that he passed away the first week of January in the hospital from SARS-CoV-2. Now, here's a person that I talked to regularly, and he was with me at the very beginning of this coverage. He was some of, you know, he, you know, he was on the show, um, you know, when we, and we were talking about ways to try to neutralize the pathogen. And we were talking about nanosilver. And this was way before the FDA came down on Alex Jones. So the, 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 the big sales that Alex Jones was doing with nanosilver at the time was coming from my show talking to Ron because Ron is the laboratory that sells it to Alex Jones. All right. So, so here again is a, you know, a first that was coming off of my show when I was talking to Ron about the benefits of nanosilver neutralizing pathogens. But then the FDA came down and then, you know, said, you know, I was trying to shut down Alex Jones and, and, you know, others that were making claims, you know, that were saying things very specific to SARS-CoV-2 um, that the FDA didn't want said. All right. So I was kind of wrapped up in that whole thing. And Ron was right Ron and I, in our conversations that are still data banks and, you know, hidden on YouTube, um, are there, you know, it'd be interesting for me to send you the videos and you can replay, replay those, those conversations on the network, but Ron is gone now because he made the decision. And I've been always a proponent of people looking at their own risk factors and making the decision to take the vaccine or not. But here I have two people that I knew one, my mother, you know, knew my mother well. I didn't know Ron as well as my mother, but, you know, over the course of covering SARS-CoV-2, I became to know Ron well. And he chose not to take the vaccine. My mother was forced to take the vaccine and both died from SARS-CoV-2. And then, you know, I have this debate with Dr. Vollmer and she's saying that Vaccines kill. Well, so does SARS-CoV-2. SARS-CoV-2 kills. It killed Ron, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm in a strange spot because I, I have the arc of covering SARS-CoV-2. It's such an early phase and some interesting players that have just randomly bumped into, you know, into, into my coverage, like Ron. He reached out to me. And then, you know, we were talking on the show, but, but, you know, some things in the background that people don't really realize were, was happening because of what was being covered on my show, such as the FDA crackdown on Alex Jones. All right. We didn't do that on purpose, though, but it just happened. You know, he was, ABL is the vendor of Alex Jones. You know, so, so, um, I don't know. It was, it, it was, it, it's, it's an it would be an interesting book to write because I've seen a lot. There's a lot of behind the scenes stuff that's not, you know, on YouTube or anything like that. That you know that has been happening. That adds to the texture of this big coverage of SARS-CoV-2. But I am exhausted from it, though. I am exhausted from. Well, I'd back ahead, away from it where I could, if you, you know, if you can, um, I think you've got stuff pretty well covered. Um, although that being said, with if, if we're looking at another cocktail here, that's something that's got to be. That, mm -hmm. and, and what's going on in Ukraine, you know, is tied to a weapons program. What's going on in the economy and going digital dollar is part of this big story. See, the thing is, is that 
there's a part of me that wants to be engaged in this to be a you know to cover it and there's also a part of me that says you know paul you've done enough you're worn out i don't know which side wins in the end but going through the process i've become a pariah in some circles and you know unfortunately i haven't seen enough wolf packing happening to help me i've seen too many people trying to tear me down yeah. too many trolls too many too many people get jealous of you know growth rates of subscribers or whatever i mean literally i have millions of views on different videos millions a lot of them are hidden a lot of them have been deleted a lot of them have been shows with with people that have lost channels the millions of views to inform the public of my understanding at the time and that's a lot i mean there's a lot of content out there i was amazed at how many people that have been mirroring my content on BitChute. i would i mean because i've been an early i've been a um an early adopter for youtube in covering sars cov 2 but a late adopter on BitChute. but i was shocked to see how many people were mirroring content and i'm glad they did because it adds to that digital footprint. So there's a lot of content out there, but there's awful lot of content and it's hidden. And, you know, and so when people are just starting to wake up to the crisis and they, you know, some people don't realize what I've talked about in the early days, it's a shocker to them because they, they try to do a Google search and, you know, a lot of the content is hidden on YouTube for, because of censorship, you know, and I've, try to populate some of this information on the other channels like Brighton. I have seven, over 700 videos in Brighton alone about SARS-CoV-2. So um, that's a lot of content. There's a lot of content missing. So when people are kind of new to the, you know, some of the things I've been covering, I was like, where were you, Paul? I, I didn't know about you. I'm like going, where were you? And I, you know, a lot of people don't realize and you know that a lot of the the trends that we were seeing in the early days came right off my show, oh. you know, but I, I end up being the pride. I end up being heavily censored by YouTube and demonetized. And yet I see these other channels, these other people gaining notoriety because they're latecomers because the people on the front line at the very beginning were the first ones to get shot. You should start oh, a Marine group. He just started a Marine group, because guess what? That's what you sound like. One of the Marines going in, brother. You're going in, you're going in hard. You don't care who gets shot. We're all going to survive. But you know something? Out of all of those people, I look at all these names, you know, big names, making much money off of YouTube through the coronavirus all the way to now, and I'm sitting there laughing. I'm like, how do you people listen to these frauds? They haven't even been banned. They haven't been strike threed. They haven't been strike twoed. Right. You know, and then they have, you know, 100,000 or 300,000 subscribers now. And I just like, I don't know. I, I, so I'm kind of, I'm exhausted for different reasons, Jack. I'm exhausted because my mother died. I'm exhausted because of medical school. I'm exhausted covering SARS-CoV-2. And I'm exhausted at seeing, being shot at on the front line in there, you know, consistently throughout the coverage of SARS-CoV-2 and seeing other channels ride the, my coattails and end up having monetization and having a larger channel. But yet they weren't the original thinkers of, of, of covering SARS-CoV-2. I was, I was almost kicked out of medical school in Harvard for what I was saying. Yep, that's the truth. I mean, think about the, the you know, not a lot of the channels could say that. Not only, a lot of channels didn't put up the money to try to find a solution to vaccine injury. It so happens to help me get my master's degree at Harvard, but, but, but I had to foot the bill for my research. I couldn't get a grant. I was a pariah. So, you know, a lot of people don't realize that. I forked up a big chunk of money to yeah. do the animal research. Oh, yes, you did. You know, oh, so I yes. just, you know, and I've been lucky to be able to have the means to do it. But, you know, and, you know, I hear Dr. Bean, you know, like, you know, or Campbell or Peak Prosperity, 
And I'm like, going, you know, did you put your money where your mouth is or you just put your mouth where your mouth is? You know, and that and it's, you know, so it's, I'm kind of tired it's, from I'm tired from the grind. So it's multifactorial. Well, I wouldn't be concerned about commercial success. Um, I mean, I would be more concerned about just getting a message out there that what well, it depends on what your interest is here. Well, I mean, well, if you want the bandwidth to get a message out there, that's 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 one thing. Um, what I what I saw in, in radio was that the, the the hosts there were two hosts that didn't succeed. The ones that conveyed truth and truth was offensive, turned people off. The other ones were that did it for themselves and for their ego. The ones that lasted, the ones that did really well, became big names. They and underneath all of that was an underlying a, a, a passion and a conviction to do good. And it was like, you know, the form followed the function. And uh, they. Sure, those, some of those people, they, they had an ego, they were grandiose, but underneath it, what mattered most to them was, was the future of the country and, and generations to come, not, not their personal notoriety. Yeah, I agree with you on that. I think my knee-jerk reaction, my knee-jerk reaction when I know my first video on SARS-CoV-2, mm -hmm. and it came true, but you know, my knee-jerk reaction was is that this was a, was a serious problem that needed to be addressed in large scale and to inform the public, and that's all that mattered. What the miscalculation I made was that I was expecting that more people would help. And because no. more people didn't help, made it, you work know, harder. it led, you know, yeah, and, and not only that, it just it led to me putting myself in a, in a precarious situation. That, that's what happens, and I, um... It took me about four years to realize that, that the reality of it, and it's a thankless, it's, it's very thankless. It, it's like medicine. Um, and, and a lot of things, all it's war, whatever, it, there's not much glory or thanks there. It's just a long, hard, slugging fight. Yeah. No, I think and, you're right about the war thing. There's a, there's a, I don't know, there's, I, I'm more fatigued, maybe. That's you know, it's a similar thing to it. Well, when you when when you put when you go at it with a willfulness, um, there's a you know I think this is it's a, in Christianity and in Judaism both. Um, you know, there's a righteous pursuit and a righteous anger, and then there's an energy, and then there's a an energy that rises from the unrighteous and. The, and the egotistical and the and the willful, the envious sort of, of anger. And that's a that's a, the people who are righteous, they and do it righteously, um, they may get fatigued and they may get tired like you do, but they uh, they they stick with it and, and in the end they find an energy. You know, that energy comes back. And and I think that you will be no, no doubt you are you are a much stronger, wiser more insightful person from from the trials that you've been through in, in ways you you wouldn't be if you hadn't have, if you hadn't ventured down that path and yeah right? i agree with you on that no I, I i agree and i remember ron um taylor saying in probably the second video yeah. he was telling me paul when you go through medical school the knowledge that you've gained through learning about how to reduce the inflammation because of the pro-inflammatory response of SARS-CoV-2 will make you a better doctor right. and way farther ahead in, in medical research and medical you know, training. Mm -hmm. um, so that will be a memory of Ron for me with him having that insight. Um, but it's painful to get to there. It's not an easy road. It's not an easy road. No, it's um, not. But, you know, and I also thought back in mid, probably mid 2020, 
I was expecting more people to galvanize against the government to shut down mandatory vaccinations and weapons program. And that because they didn't, I'm kind of like going, you know what? I probably, you know, didn't inform the public enough or people didn't care enough or they were sidetracked because of the BLM movement that was going on at the time or sidetracked because of what was going on in the election in 2020. But the focus should have been on the weapons program and the forced vaccination program. And I think that there was a missed opportunity. And now the narrative is switched to insurrectionists or you know the big lie or some other thing, which is not that important when you when you're talking about what's going on in Barrick's lab. So you know I I'm kind of I, I feel like we as a country have failed because we missed that window of opportunity I see in the middle of 2020 to tell the government stop this. Um, you are you are doing things that you shouldn't be doing and that you would hold the people accountable like Fauci and Barrick and even some of the senators that gave the green light for the funding. I mean, this is not just at Fauci's level. It goes way above Fauci. I mean, this, is, this happens at, at, at a congressional level and maybe even the White House, you know, so, um, and, and the Pentagon. So, I mean, there's a lot of actors here that need to be held accountable. But because we didn't win the war, because only the ones that win the war get to prosecute, um, you know, these people will get away with murder, literally. Yeah. You know, Fauci will get away with killing my mother. And that's just not right. But yet, that's what's going to happen. He's going to enjoy his life. You know, I don't know how old he is. I think he's close to 80 or whatever, 70 or something. You know, so he's an older researcher, right? He doesn't have that many years left. But the thing is, is that his family will just live in, you know, you know, as if nothing happened. No care in the world. You, you don't know that. Well, unless there's you an intervention of, unless you, there's some sort of intervention from, from God, you know, to strike down the family. I don't see how that's going to change. No, I mean, but, I'm sure. You know, I mean, social, like, social, you talked about social pariahism. Okay, so what if at the end of this tale, let's go down the road 10 years, all of this does become generally accepted and understood to have been what it was. Yeah. And that the public, you know, things have changed, okay, because of it. Now that family is going to be remembered, okay, like Stalin's family or Hitler's family or... Right. OK, Maybe. so see what is today and you say, well, you know, where was the great head? You know, where was the rise? I agree with you, Paul. I was looking for it, too. And I'm an old man. I ain't got but maybe one battle left. Right. And I thought this was going to be it. And I was ready to go. But nobody was moving. And then it struck me. Back in my television days, one of my television shows was kind of an MTV thing. And one of the songs that was real popular in the day was titled Too Much Information. And essentially, if we're playing chess, okay, and I'm not even sure chess could cover this. It's a much more complex game. But if you think about it, all of this unfolded simultaneously, almost as if it was strategically laid down so that most people wouldn't know which way to look. It was happening in so many different ways in so many different directions. It's old fashioned Carney's sleight of hand. Okay. And they pulled it off very well. And you and I talked about this a year ago. Okay. When we did a, an elongated show on, on the subject of where it came from and what it really is and what's behind it. And I think that the, where you're at now is you took the beach, man. You don't okay, have, but I have the bullets. Around, I have the bullets in my in my chest. Yeah, you don't have to you yeah. don't have to take the hill. Okay? That's another division. You, okay, have personalized things. This is I'm going to do my psychoanalyst here, okay? You have personalized things. The loss of your mother, 
the condition your father, etc., is a very heavy burden that you are carrying. Mm -hmm. Along with the fact that you're in school, medical school, and under very strenuous circumstances to boot. So it ain't like it's easy to just go to medical school. It's even harder to go to medical school when you got a bullseye on you. Okay, right. so you're dealing with that. And then you saw something you could not turn away from. And I know exactly where that's at. You looked in the mirror and you said, I cannot live with me knowing this and acting like nothing's going on. I got to tell somebody about it. And you did. Right. And you pay a price for that. Every warrior does for going into battle, whether he gets wounded in battle or not. Every warrior who goes into battle pays a price, carries with it for the rest of his life. Oh, so one thing I think that you have failed in all your genius, God, you're probably the most educated, smartest person I have met in my lifetime. And I've met some real smart people, but you got a lot going on between your ears. And yet you're like a plumber who can't see his own plug drain. Mm -hmm. You do have to grieve, man. You must take the time and recognize that you were hit with something very deep and very rooted in your emotional standard. And you got to deal with it. You can't walk away from it. Now, you can't drop medical school, obviously, right? You have to deal with this. But, and like I said, you've taken the beach. <laughs> and remember that everything that you're experiencing now is actually being driven by that grief. So everything at school, all of your responses, the way you react, the way people seem to react around you, et cetera, is all being driven perceptively by your grief because you're going through the stages of grief. You have to. It's how you will unfold. And you are basically denying that. <laughs> you're like going, no, I've got to put that over here and this stuff is more important. And yeah, you're exhausted. You should be exhausted. You can't cry for 90 days to not be tired. Hey, Paul, think about it, man. For almost a year and a half now, we've been battling this fight, climbing this mountain, carrying 400-pound packs, and forgot our damn water. And we still climbing the damn mountain. And we still climbing with those packs on. And guess what? Way over there in the distance, you see these sons of bitches still doing the same thing, and they didn't carry no damn packs. They just copied you. They, well, didn't they just jumped from this hill to the next hill, and you're going up the dead end now. Okay, and 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 it's not that you it's it's not that you shouldn't care. You had to care. You did your thing, man. You did your thing. Okay, you can relax now. Oh, no, in. no, 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 okay. no, no. There ain't no Watch relaxation. It, but you have other things you need to focus on. One is, you know, you're at that term level in your schooling, so obviously there's a lot of demand there for you to be prepared for whatever. Exams. I do them one time a month because I know And you mouth have to deal stop. with your grief, and I think that's enough. I think you can step back, participate, but not try to drive the machine. You don't need to lead the troops up the hill. Let somebody else lead the troops up the hill. Be one of the troops now. Well, I'll take that advice. I'll take that advice. But uh, I think that if the fourth cocktail is being released or will be released, I don't think there's going to be anyone able to cover it like I do. <laughs> oh, no, and, oh and, but, you know, <laughs> the thing is, is that uh, mm -hmm. if, if that's where it's going to go, it's where it's going to go. God right. Forbid. So we can blow the whistle. But I mean, here's the thing. There are always going to be those people. There are always going to be victims. You know, the, the lady earlier said uh, whatever her name was, uh, Volum. She, you know, she said, well, you know, it's all natural. Right. Well, yeah. OK. So it, to, in her defense, if you clarify that this disease was not natural, it didn't happen in nature. It happened in a laboratory. OK, so from that point forward. OK, the whole thing is that if this is what they're going to do, it's what they're going to do. And we can argue about the root of it or we can figure out how to exist in path of it. OK, because it's, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. You know, what's the old thing? You know, don't 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 be an optimist. Prepare for the worst possible outcome and then be thrilled when it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. OK, 
And, and I mean, you know, I, I think, that, you know, that is a whole lot. And you said it yourself, you know, you, you have agreed to be programmed in an idealism in order to get to an achievement. Kind of like an undercover agent, you know, in the old Soviet Union behind the Iron Curtain, right? Spying for the CIA, okay? They had to live that life. They had to be there, okay? They had to <laughs> exist in that environment. And the trick was not to lose yourself in the process. So can I go in here, do this thing, be this person, and not lose me? Right. Remember that this is what I'm doing. Okay, so, you know, you're inside the system, you're learning from inside the system. People 45 years ago, die hard, educated people were preaching. The only way to deal with this is get inside it because you can't stand out here and throw rocks at it. It doesn't do any good. You have to get inside it. You have to be able to see within it what it's doing and then be able to explain that to the outside world. But you can't, you got to survive inside, right? And that's the reality of it. And you are in this constant conflict right now, okay? Because this side of you is out here openly making statements predicated by the phrase, I probably shouldn't say this, I'll get in trouble and then pff, out it comes, okay? So yeah. you're over here trying to pacify these people to achieve an end. You want to understand this science. You want to be able to master this science. You know, ideally you want to be prepared to come up with the cure for the disease that you know they're gonna make. You know, the oh. idealism here is, and it's story as old as Greek mythology, Okay, somebody has cracked open Pandora's box. And I would suggest they cracked open Pandora's box back in the 1930s when they cracked that first atom. Okay, mm -hmm. that was the first toy. And they've been taking toys out of Pandora's well, box. Well, they're, they're, they're rebooting CERN, so yeah. don't be surprised that another Mandela effect happens. See, I think, <laughs> see, I think, that's, I think that is the nature of the human species. Okay, I think that's the premise of, of the whole story of Pandora's box. We are destined to go there. One, because we're curious monkeys. That's the reality. Okay, we want to, oh, what's that? What makes that work? Okay, and then we have an intellect that allows us to take dominance over those things we're curious about. Mm -hmm. And then we have this long, boring, feeling that's down deep inside that we all think that we don't have to answer to a god anymore if we can prove we are gods so let's all go in the laboratory and prove that we can do everything god can do in the laboratory now is that right is that wrong is that pandora's box see but i think we're destined if you want to play with that word you know to do this as a society we can't help ourselves you look back in history Every great society has taken itself apart, it seems. And generally over the most minute details, you know, uh, the, my curious question and all the things that you've talked about here since Miss Woolen was on, et cetera, is um, what is your impression now of their push to vaccinate infants? I mean, like these kids aren't already in isolation anyway, right? They're all right, right. Yeah, well, right. you know, be yeah, I'll, I'll answer the question and then we'll have to get going because it's been six hours of constant video. I asked this, if they were taking wagers on how long you could last. No, well, it's six hours is my max <laughs> <laughs> in one recording. So, so, but I'll answer the question and then we'll wrap it up. But I appreciate everyone that called in and, you know, in this conversation. I'll do another one and we can have a longer, a longer talk here. Um, but um, vaccination of infants for SARS-CoV-2, I think is the wrong strategy. There's very little evidence to suggest that they are a risk um, and that there's not enough research out there to understand the long-term side effects of inoculating an infant for SARS-CoV-2. If yeah, I, I had a child, look. I would not have them yeah. be vaccinated. I mean, isn't the, the for, for science, if science, if we follow medical science, 
the, yeah, the, the, the baby, I, I just don't think that there's the enough baby research. is developing a metabolism. The baby is building an immune system. Mm -hmm. Okay, which won't really be intact until that baby becomes four, maybe five, in some cases six, as a late bloomer, if you will. Okay, mm -hmm. some kids never will. Okay, they'll always have problems because their system will never develop correctly. Um, but okay, going in there and monkeying around with their immune system when their immune system is in its own transitional stages of development right. seems to me very dangerous. Right. right. No now that doesn't mean that oh, that doesn't mean that all vaccines should not be administered. No, and I'm not. I'm. I'm, I'm just you very. Know, this one I, is I an think experiment. That, okay. Yeah, Let, yeah, you know, yeah. let's go back to the beginning. From day one, this thing is an experiment. Okay. They That's admitted right. <laughs> it. They came out openly. The FDA approved it for emergency use because it was still experimental. It was unproven vaccine. It still they is. Lined everybody up like sheep, and they got them right. all shot up. Right, okay. and with the research that came out of the clinical trials that Pfizer was trying to hide, showed that at least in the adults, that there were a lot of adverse side effects that would fall in the category of autoimmune disorder, and there were like fifty listed. All right, um, can you just imagine what sort of problem, additional problems, could be had if you start? inoculating infants mm -hmm. and you won't even fully understand the ramifications till four or five or six years down the road because they're still developing their their neural networks but yeah, so but i just i just think that's... it's just asking for autism or asking for some sort of developmental disability or whatever or so immune deficiency I in, immune in adulthood deficiency, right you know right? if it's all they did was disrupt the development of the immune system then the child becomes and that goes through puberty becomes an adolescent mm -hmm. okay and now suddenly they have a whacked out immune system right there's two reasons not to inoculate the the infants there's not enough data to prove that it's safe and effective and two they're a low risk category so why risk it on something low risk it's all about the money well, and that's my and argument. obedience and obedience. They want yes. society to be obedient. Right. See, so. the, the worst the worst nightmare is that they have been they're they're actually building something, and the building something requires putting certain parts in at certain points in right. order for the gestation of the completed thing. Okay. And well, uh, you know, the in question each is one of these, it, it, in each one of these so called new vaccines, there's one part right, of right. this new thing they're building inside as many right. of us as possible. Right. You know, it could be what I call the epoxy method, you know, where it's two or three parts. Right. You know, but the thing is, is that they're building something that it potentially is biological and they're building something that's sociological in the sense of getting a society to capitulate and just do what the government tells you and allow for surveillance and allow for all these different pillars of the biopatriarch to, to come into play. So I agree with you. They're building something. Now, what exactly is it? You know, I have my own theories, but uh, we'll carry on this conversation. I find, Elon, I find Elon to be an interesting outside piece that suddenly appears in the midst of all of this, too. And well, he also been, mentioned that he didn't want to go to Mars, man. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. maybe you know. What do we maybe, have to be ready for to do that? How do we have to change our metabolism in order to survive? He's always years? been there. He's right. not I, new. I, different <laughs> argument, another day. Yeah. Right. Hey, Paul, it was interesting. Yep. Keep thank you very up. much for and participating. Remember, and, remember you man, know, you have to grieve, and you're going. You're grieving, whether you realize it, recognize it, or not. You're doing it. And so that is controlling your emotional outlooks on things right now. And you need to keep, I mean, just brain. think, think about the, just think about the, the gravity of this. The person that informs the public that it was a man-made virus in late January of 2020 ends up losing his mother in 2022 and the end of January. But that's casting stones. I mean, I'll tell you, I, you know, it's that's just like, casting stones you don't need to cast, okay? I just like, you're, I don't you're, know. It's really bad karma. Mother. That's what it is. No, no, but see, you can look at it that way, but the issues with your mother would have happened either way. 
right? She Whether you died. had gone out she old or not, in your mother was old and she was dying. She was going to die. Yeah, I agree anyway. with you on that. But the thing is, is that Fauci took from me the ability oh, to see yes, her one that's, last but time. See, that's the left hand and the right hand. You can clasp them together and call it a prayer, but it's still the left hand and the right hand. And the left hand definitely has been screwing around with us. And you did the right thing. The problem is it always comes with a price. Nobody gets out for free. And you, you chose to step up and make the statement. You were driven to do that. You have functioned in your, in your phrase. Take the accolade, okay? Yeah. You know that what you did was right, whether the rest of the world knows you were right or not. You were right. You said what you needed to say, and that is the end of that conversation. What the world does with that information now is entirely up to them. And this argument has got so far past Paul Cottrell. Okay? I mean, you know, what you did made noise, and that noise is still reverberating. Whether you're still talking or not, it's reverberating. That's People right. are coming up. People are upset. OK, and, and they keep trying to put down more. And that's going to be the straw that breaks the camel's back. It's not going to be this virus. It's not going to be the shots. It will be indirectly. It's going to be this mandating. See, this yeah. is, they've had it. OK, you're not going to come back around again and convince us that we're going to wear masks and get in line for this and that. And the other. It's not going to happen. People are not going to go along with the program, or at least a vast majority of them are not going to go along with the program. And then whatever happens after that is going to happen. Who knows? Okay. They could all sit down and decide to just not, right? It could all have something to do with an election in November. I don't really think so because I think they're all in cahoots. So I don't think there is such a thing as a Republican and a Democrat. I think there are politicians and the rest of us jokers, right? Who have allowed them to take control. Well, they're you can be my be working vice president. For us, and right? for, you can. Yeah. Robert, you can be my vice president when I run for president. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. We can't go. We can't even go down that road at all. No, absolutely not. All right. I, will be, I will be your counselor advisor in the back room, but no, no public office here. No. All right. All right. Well, I got to get going. It's been six hours of constant recording and I'm got gotcha. you. Hey, now. Paul, take care. Talk to you later. OK, thank, thank you, you everybody for joining Zoom. And, you know, please, please uh, join Zoom again when I when I do these shows. Thank, thank you, Daryl. Thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you, Righteous, Ken, for, for joining us. you. Remember, Paul, righteous, not resentful. Uh, okay, that's good. That's good advice. And, Daryl, thank you for doing the simulcast. Brother, I'm up for you anytime you need me. You know that. All right, I'll talk to you later. All right, bless us, brother. Have a good night, doctor. Get some sleep. Good night. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye.